in front of me so you guys can hear me. Mm -mm -mm. I got my portal mug with me and it's mandatory. It's not a good presentation without um, a mug like this. So yeah, um, I'm just checking that <clears throat> everything's all right in terms of uh, stream quality. Um, just to make sure it is working. Just gonna check if it my is working. working. Just, just gonna, gonna check, check if it is working. Cool, that's what I wanted to know. I've got eco, that's perfect. Um, all right, so um, here we go. Uh, I'm gonna make this uh, exceptionally long. It's gonna be like a three or four hour video. It's um, already 10 p.m. if you can see right now. I got a pretty long day and it's a Monday and I didn't sleep really well. So, I'm going to make to to make to make uh, an introduction to um, Apache Cassandra, big data elements and stuff like this. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm going to go through all this. <clears throat> I just wanted to make a few checks before we go. Uh, this is going to be on Twitch and it's going to be on YouTube then because there will be replay of this. Um, so without further waiting, here we go. I'll just appear in small part of the screen now, so you can hear me but see me very small. Yeah, that's just perfect. Uh, I'm just checking that this is still visible on cam. Checking that, that just to make sure it works. And that's fun. Yeah, I like the idea. You got the idea. All right, so let's go back to Apache Cassandra, right? Um, so, wait, I'm just checking one last thing with my. Because um, I got no more little voice. I'm just going to talk not too loud. Not too faint, but just in between. Um, I'm just going to check my on stream with the Twitch mobile app because I want to make sure I don't have to do this like a thousand times. It's funny as it, li as it seems, says I'm streaming Apex Legends, which I'm not. <laughs> I forgot something. Let's just say we're streaming just chatting, right? All right, that's just perfect now. Um, that will be better. Let's just check everything. All right. It looks like I'm fine. It looks like I'm fine. So, without further waiting, let's go. So, um, first of all things, um, this course is in French, usually. So, my slides are in English and I usually talk French, so uh, my, my my slide comments, which I'm going to read and go through, are all in French. So this is a challenge to me. I'm just live translating when I just did these lessons for students in um, third year of uh, degree in France, what we call the licence pro. Uh, it's just a third degree um, course, basically. So this is intended to be a course for lots of things. I'm go we're going to talk big data, data processing, modelization, uh, relational paradigms, and non-relational paradigms. Uh, we're going to illustrate this with um, a well-known uh, DB management system uh, that is made for large scale, uh, which is mostly known as Apache Cassandra. So yeah, um, I'm just going to arrange my notes so that I see the notes. Uh, the first liminary thing, uh, if you are already familiar with Apache Cassandra, you don't need this course, absolutely nothing will be new for you. Um, and this is about to be four hour long, so mm. let's bet that I can do this uh, under four hour, but I don't think I'm going to. So, yeah, um, feel free to uh, comment in whatever you like or you don't like in this video uh, in the comments when they're already. So take a seat, relax, take a mojito or something, just like something you need, uh, like a beer or anything. If you don't like a whole alcohol, just drink some tea, whatever. Let's go. So, uh, a few things before we start, um, a few words about me. Uh, my name is William Pino. I'm what I call myself a ninja. I'm just a web architect, lead developer, um, web developer, agile coach. Uh, I make lots of things in the world of computing. Uh, I've been working for 14 years right now, mostly in computing um, sector actually, essentially on web. Um, I'm working currently in a, in a software company that's called Neosoft in France. 
And I mean Limoges, it's a great city, uh, home of a porcelain actually, or something like that. And I'm a contributor to um, some open source projects like PHP CS Fixer, Symfony Documentation, Drupal, uh, the PHP Documentation, um, Composer, uh, website mostly, and PHP Framework Interoperability Group. Uh, that's hard to say, FEG, PHP Fig. So uh, right now I'm working as a, I would say, project manager, whatever you want to call it to be, technical, responsive, responsible, and person in charge, um, architect and developer. You can find me on, uh, I'm going to activate the cursor here, so I'm gonna need, you can find me on uh, GitHub, Git, um, GitLab, and Twitter. Um, most of the projects are private, but some are public too. I'm also a photographer and musician, so you can find me on Instagram, YouTube, Flickr, 500 projects, and cloud, whatever. And for those who like, this is completely irrelevant here, but I'm um, mostly uh, playing Magic the Gathering and Apex Legends, because I got a world record on this game, yeah. And many other games. Uh, you can also find me on Twitch, as you can see. Uh, and of course, Facebook, Snapchat, whatever, TikTok, whatever you like it to be. So the purpose of this course is quite simple. Mm. We're going through, um, I'll say, I hope less than four hours. Uh, talk about what a database is, talk about the CAB theorem and what there's no idle solution to store data. Um, we're going to show how we build an architecture that answers and addresses those problems. Uh, we're going to make a whole lap around the solution of Apache Xandra and what it offers. And uh, we're going to see in details um, the ways you can use Apache Xandra. So, uh, as a synthesis, um, the purpose of this is to just um, take some recoil on what is um, what you think a database is supposed to be, uh, just detached from the relational model, which is, as you can see, something, but not everything, uh, to break away from uh, SQL2, um, SQL, whatever you want it to be, um, to understand the uh, problematic of the workloads and as you go with scalability of data storage. Uh, and to understand what has changed in this world that we're living of over 20 years uh, in the information systems, uh, to try also to master and understand what the Apache Cassandra architecture is and how we can use it. I'm just checking that my face doesn't block anything on the screen, which is good. Okay, let's go. So, um, first of all, you should just know why, why we should just talk about all this crap, you know? Because uh, um, you, you think that this is going to be too much for you, and maybe, maybe you're right, because. Uh, this legitimately, you don't need everything that's in NoSQL and so large scalable data systems, so do I. So I think it just concerns like 10% of people at worst. So yeah. So uh, maybe a quarter of people who are developing worldwide are concerned by such systems and problematic, but why not? So you have heard about this um, DBMS. Uh, you have heard about this heavy breaking walls Apple stuff, like the thing they are doing, like what no one does in the world, which is really large. So you say, yeah, yeah, Apple is using it. Should be, should be good, right? It's just one company in a world, so it should be good, yeah. Does it exist really or not? And of course, you just ask, like, yeah, seriously, does it, does it help in any way? And while well, Apache Xandra is over ten years old, um, and yes, it is serious. Uh, it is huge. It is used right now at scales and levels that are quite hallucinating. So yeah, um, most of the time, your projects won't be. Uh, of a, on a scale that is susceptible to uh, raise this kind of technological problematic. So yeah, um, but yeah, you should be conscious about this kind of solution just to help you clarify things. Uh, if you need one this, if you need this like one of those days, and uh, it should help you um, conceive and build better architectures uh, in the world. You know, um, just as a summary, you know. Uh, I'd say most of the large projects in this world have considerably failed during the first days. Um, most of the time because they are victims of their success. Like if you talk about like Diablo 2 in 1999, um, I recently saw an interview of, yes that's a video game, that's a world record video game for the most sales uh, compared to population in uh, one week. They sold one million copy in one week. Uh, in 1999, that's already 21 years old, uh, soon 22, that's crazy, thinking of it. I was waiting for it, was a water ginger. Um, yeah, so but when they released W2, they just made online servers for the first time with Battle.net and a, a service that would allow you to find people and stuff, and everything broke down because there were so many people connecting, it just broke. Um, 
In the USA in 2013, then uh, 13, they just um, set up a new a new system to if you're not from the USA, you have to buy your own health insurance in the USA. And there are public discounters and people who just actually there's a market for that. And the United States uh, state decided to organize this by putting a website that would be official uh, to just manage all this uh, health insurance. And it just broke for a few months because uh, it barely handled 10% <clears throat> of the people because there were way too many people connecting to it. It was just blown up. Okay, so just like um, Among Us, for example, if you have played Among Us, this real tiny ugly video game that was out recently, it's perfect. The game is just so cool to play. It's like it's costing three or four euros, like the same in US dollars, whatever you're watching. And uh, Among Us has so many people playing it, but the servers are barely coping with it, you know. Uh, they are broken most of the time and uh, there's so many people connecting right now that you get lagged. You have to try to connect several times to find a server. So yeah, uh, this means like there's sometimes a, a lightning fast success, and you're not um, you're not protected against those successes, which is cool. So yeah, why not? W what what do we do with it? Mm. I mean, if you look at dbranking.com, it's a DBMS specialized website. Uh, there are over three hundred and fifty um, database management systems, so you should at least know some of them. Yeah, I put I put the first top one hundred on the right, so you see I'm not I'm not lying to you. You, you should at least know a few of them. You know, Oracle, as an RDS, Redis, uh, DB2, of course, one of the top things um, from the past, one of the first ones. Uh, um, Elasticsearch, Cassandra, SQLite, um, MariaDB. We're gonna fall back on this um, a little more. We're gonna come back to this. Uh, in the next slide. So why are they that many databases? Uh, if you look what market share is about right now, there's just pretty much everything for everyone. Uh, there are hundreds um, of database management systems. Some are free, some are open source, some are proprietary, sometimes internal to certain companies and are not made public until like years later. Um, because yeah, we had to store the data somewhere to store your likes of uh, kittens falling out for the couch. So you have to s store this somewhere. Um, if you have the reference to this quote, by the way, I'm really happy that you are, and I like you as a person. <laughs> so first of all, let's talk about databases. Uh, we talk about the uh, legendary um, owner and leader on the market, Oracle. Uh, I, could, I could just put thousands of them on the slides, but um, I just cho chose to put Oracle for several reasons. Uh, first of all, it's a company that's whose heart of the system and core business is data storage. Uh, it's been a legend since 1977 in the world of data. Like Oracle is the absolute combo breaker. They, they are so famous, it's crazy. It's a company that addresses pretty much every business problematic, uh, even the most extreme ones in terms of relational storage too. Uh, they conceive ultra robust, um, scalable and secure databases. So it's one of the systems that also uses um, famous recognized and established standard like SQL, um, SQL and, and, and also PLSQL, uh, their own extended version of it. Um, they have database um, that are object oriented databases. So they have, among other things, they have pretty much what you, what you need. So uh, it's also they, they do a service on premise, like you are just handle on your old servers, um, you know, on the your backbone of servers too. And uh, they also um, do cloud storage and cloud-based services right now. So it's one of the three leaders in the market. Depending on the year, it's uh, in terms of representation, it's always the leader market in terms of uh, money and income, you know, business income. So it's quite heavy, it's quite expensive, it's quite powerful. It's the answer that most companies, private or public, um, especially the largest ones, of course, appreciate. Um, I would say that you should dodge this solution and try to avoid uh, offering this kind of um, technical response to smaller solutions and smaller structures, uh, nevertheless, because it's pretty costly. Um, so the database management systems, uh, are mostly known for their relational systems and aspects. So you have, they have been, yeah, pretty much um, criticized over the last years. Like if you know who's Bob, who Bob Martin is, Bob Martin is just the voice of God for software developers. Uh, he said, uh, Bob Martin said one thing that I liked. He said, we mostly invented uh, relational database systems to mostly sell uh, experts in relational database systems, which is 
fun and true actually so <laughs> yeah so um a few years ago we started to go back to NeoSQL because um non-relational databases uh in, in, the, in the terms of non-relational non databases and especially with no intermediary language uh interpreted language to interact with the data uh, and and that was the start of everything um, it's actually not MySQL even though it looks like it's a my in English it's me uh, MySQL um, mostly for open source uh, that became a company later on that was bought by Sun Microsystems and Sun was bought by Oracle in 2009 um, that could that just may have the community dubbed in terms of con in, in conflicts of interest they say nah we don't we don't want this you know it's just it's just not completely free, so MySQL take two back with development, um, and they did a, a, a parallel. The, the initial developer of MySQL uh, did a fork uh, and and um, started a new project in open source um, on, uh, under the name of MariaDB, and the two solutions are quasi similar uh, ever since. Uh, for the record, me uh, Mui, but you should pronounce Mui actually, is the name of the third daughter of this developer, and Maria is the second one, so that's why it's called Mui SQL and Maria SQL, and, uh, Mi, Mi SQL and uh, Maria DB. So, um, of course, you got the SQL server, um, <coughs> the SQL so solution for Microsoft. Uh, the SQL server is just um, because of the 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 establishment and the large scale of the unified systems and ecosystem of Microsoft. Um, SQL Server is just um, one of the top solutions of the market because it's Microsoft, so everyone's been using Microsoft and it, it couples well with Microsoft's and databases and uh, it's complementary of Access, for example, which is more, um, I would say, desktop-oriented and less powerful, but it works. And last but not the least, I'll just like to mention SQLite. Um, which is a very slight micro database. Uh, it does not require anything to be started, it just uh, doesn't use a server in the sense of um, MySQL or PostgreSQL. Uh, it's very light, it's uh, made from micro apps uh, that need to be deployed quickly and just uses SQL actually in a very reduced and optimized way. So, yeah, that's cool. Um, then you have um, the need of um, databases. Why we, do we invent databases? Uh, the databases just came from an industrial need that we needed to decouple um, the storage expertise and um, due to the um, growing mass storage expertise and use uh, like uh, magnetic um, you know tapes and stuff like that and what we call the Winchester hard disk drives um, it's just the same thing you know Winchester is just technology of rotating hard disk drives um, so they origin from they originate from the the 1950s for the relational ones and the 1980 um, from the later ones and through a, a later consortium uh, they defined a, a common interaction language because everyone was developing their own uh, interaction language so they say, just don't scatter all around. Let's go back to one language, please. All databases should use one language. So they define what you call the SQL, the SQL, the Structured Query Language. Um, but yeah, we can just touch this SQL thing. Um, usually learn to, to know things about databases uh, with it because it's easier. And um, I mean, understanding things in bidimensional um, tables and arrays is just pretty easier for everyone so yeah but when we started the computing we just didn't have those and uh, yeah so um, the new school world is made of four actually more than this but let's just break this down into four storage categories so first of all we have document storage uh, document storage is file or secured objects like mongodb or CouchDB that are very very um, flexible you know they got uh, lots of duplication and overhead but it's cool then you've got what we call column storage uh, where you just basically stored uh, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, and not by line, hello, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. That's just a, a difference on how you store data, but yeah. So like Cassandra we talked about, and or HBase, um, this is uh, more oriented into, requires more storage capacity. Uh, it's um, mostly optimized for very similar and redundant, redundant uh, data, of course. Uh, you also have the key value storage like DynamoDB from Amazon, or like Redis or Memcached with 
those databases actually the lighter ones um, using the RAM uh, which is of course really really faster than uh, hard disk storage or even SSD storage uh, but the updates are quite complex uh, the requests are very very simple and ultra basics but the input output the IO is just uh, wall break and everything you know so yeah you should use this from time to time Redis is really cool um, and also you have uh, graph oriented storage like this is a fundamental math um, notion like you got new 4j actually uh, which is really ultra relational like it's overly relational it's po <laughs> it's uh, poorly relational actually it's very malleable you know but it's quite limited so yeah no 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 SQL uh, has lots of storage but there's no perfect solution to anything so yeah uh, the advantages so you usually have um, inserts and um, reads that are less greedy uh, the data the data schema are easy to store they're not structuring so that's cool they are scalable they are um, known to partition more easily they are made for this partitioning you know uh, they're made for statistics um, data aggregation uh, analytics and everything like that and the drawbacks in the white drawbacks uh, they're not really cool when it comes to updates read delete and insert um, but updates are really uh, harder, you know. They are not ACID, we're going to talk about this uh, on the next slides. They are less reliable, uh, the read times are slightly smaller, and there's no implicit joins, of course, because there's no SQL, so you don't, you don't first compose your data and then break back and assemble your data to get what you want. So you can join things, but it's really <coughs> harder. So yeah, if you just at a glance need to know what about it, what is about just MongoDB, DynamoDB, Amazon, services whatever and uh couch db right and um last but not the least as i was saying about you got um, memcached already so that use ram so they're hallucinating in terms of speed um of course they got a backup if you just shut down the server and restart the server they just back things up on the hard disk and then from the hard disk to the ram so there's no difficulty in that so yeah and of course we need to talk about distributivity which means how you set up a database on several machines um, cloud storage usually hides and obfuscates this aspect so you don't see what's ha happening behind the scene actually but many many systems um, offer solution storage uh, storage solutions uh, that are partitioned actually so you you create storage clusters you um, you scatter this on several locations and we often talk about scalability because uh, the database um, are scalable and it's more complex to to um, to, to scatter and there's usually a funnel of performance uh, in applications due to the databases so you have to have a very reliable and performant databases so if you never heard of data replication um, and how to do so uh, just ask yourself how do you know that it's going to work when you gather 100 machines that they share one database and that the data is inserted in one of them. What's happening behind the scene, you don't know. Um, so you also need to speak about um, the easiness of saving data. Um, that's where your data goes. Vital data like uh, sensitive data, like GDPR, bank data, um, private life, etc. So you have to talk and think about data separation too. So we talk about tombstones and stuff we're gonna talk about uh, in, the, in, the, in the next slides. So yeah, and um, if you talk about CouchDB, Elasticsearch, or Firebase, real-time database, if you haven't checked it, this is a Google product that we bought, we bought a few years ago, it's cool. Uh, they just make embedded um, services into browsers and components on every other applications. They are replicated, um, auto-replicated through cross-device things, and which is really interesting what we're doing. So we're just hiding the storage part more and more. We're just adding the traps on layers. So we don't really often wonder what is hidden behind the scenes so yeah that was a glance at what we knew what we knew about the databases so that was just uh, talking about general database things all right so we do have problems um we do have problems that appear mostly with this 20 years i say we are last 20 years so first of all uh, it's a concept that you should just have heard about it's called big data it just designates the fact that you have to process data uh, often often unordered data just uh, random discrete data you know um, 
so in, in such large scales that it just goes over what a human can conceive, you know. And most of the time, the classic tools and storage uh, are not adapted and are relevant to this kind of data processing. So they are too small and they don't even store everything. So yeah, like everything, the, the, the quantity of data storage right now used through the world is growing at an exponential rate. Um, so yeah. One of the reasons, the key reasons of AI today uh, rising is that we needed some new technologies and things that could work as a flow of streaming, you know, and not on the whole big picture of data. So no, yeah. Um, just remember the complexity of algorithms right now uh, makes the data processing and the results uh, exact, exact results um, impossible to find. So sometimes you have to just cut through the fact that there is so much data you just don't, you cannot process everything you just gonna go through. So to go through data processing at a high level, which is not the purpose of this talk today, we're not gonna talk about this, but you have to go through, first of all, statistics and performance and algorithmics, uh, of course, but also machine learning and in a larger way, in a broader way, uh, artificial intelligence. So yeah, and big data um, officially comes uh, from this concept and the need for storage today comes for this principle of big data which is not something we decided just happened so to sum up what's happening to internet it's pretty simple uh, and I always sum it with the same sentence now your mum is on YouTube with a smartphone that is the challenge now your mum is on YouTube with a smartphone I mean mine is too <laughs> so uh, what does it what does it mean? Um, it means a lot of things, uh, and uh, we're not talking about your mom, you know. It's just uh, it's just a word like that. Um, it just means that um, people today have changed their modes of life. They just buy, they sell, they they get some money. Um, twenty four hour, twenty four twenty four seven, you know, three hundred sixty five days a year, and um, services are now accessible nonstop. I mean. We can just uh, put social uh, file deposit on night in France, which is something we could not conceive. Uh, we can manage our bank accounts on a Sunday. <laughs> uh, maybe you didn't know it, but it wasn't possible a few years ago. I mean, yeah, essentially 20 years ago, this was not possible. You had to go to the bank. So you had to go on only a few days per week. So yeah, because everyone is on the internet right now, the El Dorado for, um, Pioneers, adventurous is just over. Uh, now you have uh, multinational companies, you know, worldwide companies who just invaded the internet. Then came the long trail of the whole great public audience, and then the states came in, and then the governments, and everyone actually. So from Pokemon Go to Apex Legends, from Instagram to Netflix, from YouTube to Twitch, from Amazon to Wish, from PlayStation Network to Shazam, uh, those apps have something in common. They generate and read over millions, if not billions, billions of recordings per week, sometimes per day, sometimes per hour. So today we are counting uh, the success of apps in terms of millions of users. Um, we used to do the same thing like 20 years ago with hundreds, pretty thousands of users, and we already thought it was already cool, but things have changed, you know? So we just multiplied everything on uh, a scale factor that is incredible and that, th such as the, the number of users have and, and, and manipulated and handled data has exploded way, way faster than the machines have grown in terms of power and, and quality. So you also have to add that we just created new um, usage. Uh, everything is connecting to the internet. Uh, I mean, everything is not everyone. Everything, thing is happening. Uh, but thing is really the core word here. Um, just like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that was really, really different. And I can tell you already with 2021 making this presentation, in 10 years, it's gonna be really different too. The things like we say in English that connect, uh, that are on the network is just become crazy shit, you know. Uh, everything's connected. Uh, it's gonna change in a hallucinating way. Um, in the years to come, what's happening to us? Uh, you have to know that at the moment I'm speaking right now, some people sold 
uh, beaten nails on the internet. Yes, we just sold um, bottles of air with nothing else than air inside. Like you open the bottle, you close it, and you put it for sale. Um, baby cars, you know, that are autonomous because you just want to be jogging on the side. You want to be running um, while walking the babies. Uh, connected wine bottles, and I'm not saying this because I'm French, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, um, dental uh, wires that are intelligent, you know, connected. Yes, we do this. The world is, is changing. And to support this change, we also have to store the change first and think then. So that's mostly what's happening to change in the world right now. You have to... Uh, n we're just gonna see how we still think a little. Actually, we're not really not thinking. If you look at um, the states and the, the uh, statements we are making, uh, those are Ericsson sources. Uh, what do we see? We see that um, notebooks, the, the market for notebooks, have just surpassed the uh, desktop computers in 2008, approximately. We know that mobile has crushed and annihilated a number of um, other buys and products like personal computers, notebooks, plus desktops in 2010. Uh, we know that mobile web traffic just uh, overcame the um, desktop internet traffic in 2015. We know that um, the internet mobile traffic has surpassed the internet desktop traffic in 2016. Uh, we know that we have exhausted the IPv4 possible addresses in 2019. Actually, from 2016 to 2019, but yeah. Mm. <clears throat> what we also know with a, a pretty good certitude is that the market for all connected objects is going to eat everything and devour everything. In the next years, the number of um, connected objects that you can see on this graph is, this is a projection, right? We're still here, remember. It's going to explode and it's going to devour connections. I mean, it's even worse than it looks. Um, actually, there's going to be a boom in everything. <laughs> so um, this is data from the Council of Strategy Analytics, by the way. Um, it's more or less stable, but it's going to be in, in a growth all the time, as you can see. It's going to be a growth and non-stop growth uh, over the years to come, and it's never, never going to stop. Uh, it's more or less stable, but um, there's going to be a growth on everything. Uh, we estimate that there's going to be 38.6 billion device connected in 2025. That's way more than human people on Earth. And we estimate there will be 50 billion connected things in 2013. So IoT, the Internet of Things, is going to go ahead, of course, but um, especially the professional IoT, you just have to know that, I mean, the middle of France, in you know, a pretty average city, like 140, 150,000 inhabitants. Uh, eight minutes away from me, there's a company that connects um, ambulances. You know, they collect emergency cars for all, like over years and years. They've been doing this for years. Uh, we connect the houses too, uh, just not only for the pleasure to have uh, lights that um, go on your favorite color or not, like, uh, okay, Google, éteins la lumière. I'm just speaking in French, and as you can see, I just shut down the lights in my in my apartment. So uh, I like it. It's cool. Uh, Philips, you whatever you like it to be is uh, is a thing. And um, the problem is we're gonna have all these sorts of things uh, in the years to come. So there's gonna be a pretty large number. I'm, I'm putting white lights back uh, so you can see me there. Uh, it's going to be a pretty large amount of these things all around us. So yeah, uh, you have to know this. Uh, they just don't light when you ask them. It's going to change depending on your humor, uh, depending on you come home, the time of the day. Like right now, if I light on my lights, they are going to um, light on uh, in, in a very smooth and slight color during the night and a pretty bright thing during the day, depending on the weather outcast outside and many other things like this. So yeah. And what is IoT? So IoT is just uh, billions of machines, um, more or less large, that are based on everything that technical progress allowed, like uh, the miniaturization, um, optimizing the components, um, making costs, uh, manufacturing costs, you know, the, uh, the upgrade of the network um, covering, you know, about the, the country, the landscape, 
And uh, there's been a market creation and the audience, the public, everything's, everyone's been, you know, sensitive to uh, this kind of um, new stuff. So yeah, you have to remember that uh, 10 years ago, I was already working for a demotic uh, company, you know, for, um, I just um, want to check this, what I'm saying. Um, yeah, uh, the, a company that was just working in the world of um, home automation, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah, when 2021 was 10 years ago. And four years ago, I was working for the company that just ended up a, a product that was, um, uh, uh, there was uh, a mobile application you just put on your smartphone, you put a small, like a pen into a plant and it would just give you uh, the plant health, like if the, the ground you're using, you know, was healthy or not, if you needed water, nutrients and, and stuff like this, uh, in a connected way, just one battery inside and that was pretty cool. Uh, both companies were French, so just imagine where Google uh, bought Nest, the connected object specialist for house, like for three dot two billion of dollars, you know, and it was already 2014, so it was a pretty long time ago. So as for the mobile, it's just what destroyed everything. Uh, we sold with men on the right, mostly, but not only, but he did um, the shift, actually. We sold the world the idea that experience should not be limited by time and anything else, weather or geography. So we saw that we could access everything all the time. So this is a semi-boomer, semi-zoomer speaking. And I can tell you, uh, I just remember the time where you could sleep at night, you know. Um, I also remember the time where you have waiting lines. Uh, there's still some of these things outside, but they're getting uh, less and less common, actually. You see less and less waiting lines, so yeah. Um, now we're just waiting for everything to happen instantly, um, but it works at the first glance. And this is why we developed new mobile generations like the second generation, the third generation to access web on a mobile, the fourth generation to have photo and video on mobile quality, and the fifth generation uh, to have human quality video and to connect everything in the internet around us. So yeah. So the second aspect that changes everything and that goes against everything is on contrary to what we just call the CAP theorem. So just to sum up, in 1998, there was a guy named Eric Brewer, pretty good guy, who theorized for the, same, for the first time something, but it's quite simple and based on statements and empirical um, uh, statements, you know. Uh, he, he said that in a distributed system, it's impossible to have a reliable network. So you have to make choices and you will either uh, go for consistency or you will go for availability. So that's why you usually call CAP partition tolerance, availability and consistency. So the coherence uh, or the consistency, whatever you call it to be, is that all the nodes in the system should exactly see the same data at the same time. There's no there's no offset, there's no time difference between the nodes. The availability here uh, is a warranty that all the requests have a response. Like you always answer and you always answer something relevant to the request or whatever is asking. And the petition tolerance is that there should be no less important um, failure than a complete network failure that should prevent the system to correctly answer. And if you have um, a partition of several subnetworks like data centers, they should all work autonomously, like independently from other systems. So if you want to talk about what it does, um, about AP, for example, you have DNS systems. Uh, if you have, uh, if you want to talk about CA, consistency, availability, you have mostly relational databases, actually, that's why they are pretty famous and good. And if you want to talk about CP uh, consistency and petition tolerance, you have uh, bank applications, mostly. So Apache Cassandra is usually um, described as an AP uh, system. This is why you are starting, you see now, to drift away from relational databases in your head slowly. Um, yeah, and it's, it's, um, 
is supposed to sacrifice consistency in, uh, in, 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 in favor of availability, but it's not really what it does. And it's a little false because with Cassandra, you just try to maximize consistency, sacrificing a little performance for a lot of consistency, but you can also uh, ask for perfect consistency if you want it. All right, so yeah. Uh, and last but not the least, two acronyms that I wanted to uh, terms in terms uh, talk about in terms of databases: uh, ACID and BASE. Of course, it's a uh, troll. This, the second one is a troll for the first. Mm. If you have been into chemical, you know chemistry a little of your life, you will see that hey, I know this term, right? <laughs> yeah, it's mostly about pH, but not only. So um, ACID is an acronym that just applies to four principles that. Um, transactions with databases should follow in respect. Uh, in other terms, when you use uh, DBMS, you should abide by those pr four principles that the solutions handle for you. Of course, you don't have to uh, take care of them, they just do it for you. The A is for um, atomicity in transactions. It is possible that there are several instructions or logical elements, but you have to make sure to ensure that everything is done in one time or never. Uh, so if you just cannot ensure the complete execution of the transaction, then you have to be able to go back and cancel everything. Uh, you have to talk about everything like um, broken network, um, rebooting system, shutdown, power shutdown, whatever. The C is for consistency. It means that after execution, your database should just stay in a valid state, which is usable, which means you can have triggers, events like Data is inserted or something like rollbacks, if you want to do, to say data is going back. Um, in, in a glance, if something is finished, we can start a new something again straight away. I is for isolation. Uh, it means that every transaction has to be isolated from others. Like if it was the only transaction, uh, the transactions cannot be um, depending one on each other. They cannot rely one on each other. So it means if you just execute the transactions in parallel way, you know, you obtain the same results all the time. Uh, but you, if you just were to execute this um, simultaneously or in a series, you know, that's just going to be the same results. They will not have uh, collateral damage uh, and they will um, not alter each other. And the D is for durability, which means when a transaction is finished, uh, you should take uh, you should take like a nuclear strike on your machine. And of course, if it resists a nuclear strike, which is not going to happen right now, um, it should have theoretically conserved everything. So when a transaction declares that it's finished, it just commits. It commits, and it once it's committed, it cannot be altered. So um, of course, you can just come back later on to cancel this by doing the opposite of this. It's just going to be a new transaction. So these four rules will just help you begin uh, understand the, 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 the utility of uh, SQL transactions, uh, notably with the, the keywords commit, rollback, save point, set transaction, if you want to give it a name, or sometimes begin in some uh, DBMS like a SQL server, I think. Um, also, you can um, you can go for specific uh, lock, like select something for update in MySQL, and you know why there is an option named auto commit in the database. Yeah. So uh, since the new SQL uh, emerged and uh, went pretty uh, well, like it's being a thing right now, uh, we also sometimes some people just theorized the opposite, which is the base system. Base is for basically valuable, soft state, eventual consistency. So basic ability means there has always be a answer, but it's not the answer you're looking for. It could be a waiting answer, uh, the promise of a for future uh, processing, but you don't know. Um, S is for system. Uh, the system is always uh, a stable system. This, this is what soft state means, you know. Uh, and the system could change even if you don't use it. Uh, and E is for eventual consistency. Uh, there will be a consistency one day. When the data stops flowing in, the system will stabilize. But considering the fact that the system is going to continue accepting data, it just never checks the consistency between new checks, okay? So, yeah. Also, 
one more problem. So we saw about the big data, we saw about the CAP theorem with advancing this course, yeah. And the problem was that right now is um, we are at an era where everything is just going over the capacity of one single uh, machine. And the problem is we're at, a, at an epoch right now where everything is too large, too heavy, everywhere. If you heard about um, Amazon Snowmobile, maybe you see that those trucks that carry exabytes of data uh, from private servers to cloud, migrations mostly. Um, you, you know what I mean, right? So yeah, uh, you have to think that apps should be uh, available non-stop and everywhere. So now we're talking about terabytes, petabytes, exabytes, zettabytes, yottabytes. The, 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 the gigabyte era is already over. In terms of storage, it's, it's just like the megabyte was 10 years ago. So you have to start about very, very big thing, okay? And one last problem we have to um, is with relational databases where everything is stored locally, in the currently working paradigms, you have to sometimes, of course, uh, update your software, update containers, update virtual machines, DBMS. You'll have to start maintenance operations on data, on structures, or migrate the structures. And most of the time, you'll have to shut down the machines. So you have to shut down the system. So you have to put everything in a maintenance mode. And that's also a problem we'll have to address because we don't want the systems to go down. I, I, I know it's just, it looks weird, but you don't want systems to go down anymore right now. Like it should be a very short maintenance problem, but you cannot say every time you're going to deploy something, we're going to cut down the machines. So yeah. Also, one last uh, aspect of the world changes that we know today is the abstraction of online services. So we are progressively leaving a world where we used to rent a server uh, to a new world for a new world where we just uh, rent the people who just maintain the servers. And we just basically just rent the services that we just need. And everyone is pretty good with that. So yeah. Uh, so a few things about cloud. Uh, the cloud is that thing you have, but no one knows how it works and it's just pretty much everywhere. Um, cloud is abstraction of services and the subtraction of a necessity to uh, app keep and maintain your platforms yourself. You know, uh, you, you, you start from IaaS to PaaS to something new, you know. You will see those things on the internet, you know, they are challenged and um, improved on a regular basis. You always talk about something as a service, air quotes, um, which is uh, we just basically choose where we stop paying and where your role begins. So you see it in this schema, you know, this on site AIS, PIS, SIS, uh, gradual change of responsibilities, you know. So, what is cloud computing? Is um, providing services that are dematerialized so you don't have to take care of the hardware, um, API accessible, so you don't build your architectures with clicks and file configurations. Basically, just nothing more than this. Um, um, evol evolutive, you know, the scalable uh, scalable uh, um, infrastructures, so they can go down to zero, zip, like when no one is um, solicitating them, you know, and they are also made to, and designed to absorb the workloads raised. So, uh, without the whole uh, machine park, you know, just going down, the whole architecture is just crushing, you know. They are uh, built on uptime, so you just pay when the machines are, the pseudo machines, you know, are pseudo on because they are always on. And sometimes for the volume of data stored or, or processed, for some reason, like when you have, when you use calculation services from Amazon, for example. Uh, cloud can be private or public, and yeah. To understand what cloud uh, business model is about is pretty easy to understand. Uh, the gigantic mass of data stored and, and services working and running just mutualizes the uh, setup costs, the maintenance costs, and the human costs. So it also uh, makes research and development um, more, how does it say, so more... Um, 
but better in terms of money income you know you'll just get you'll just get more money when you do this so um, you know in, in a in a phrase if you just had to sum up uh, when you need to work on a very large volume you are uh, good in terms of money you're good uh, it's something that is that applies to everything in life and not only on on means and goods and services uh, sales it's just good for everything so it looks like simple but it allows by um, replication game you know replication sets to have data accessible from anywhere in the all in the world to anyone uh, like a hundred percent of the time or close to a hundred percent of the time which is not something easy to do but they almost achieve it so it also saves um, having to handle yourself uh, the um, the backups and the service level agreements and uh, the failure in, in terms of uh, infrastructure failure so you don't have to uh, contractually do this yourself and if you want to know why people are not always going cloud uh, it's just always the same thing it's just about risk management so yeah and data so rain uh, which is when data is not in your structure it's not sometimes not even in your country people are really allergic to that say so there's, there's a old there's a, an old thing that people say from cloud or like 10 years old uh, people say there's no cloud computing it's just someone else's computer so that is what people don't really like the cloud all the time so yeah and also uh, a bullshit word but that working sometimes that you will hear about that is starting to raise right now is serverless uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good concept that extrapolates the idea by just putting uh, at disposal only the infrastructure while you are executing a process so you don't need to have a setup for an infrastructure and then start a process you just start the process that generates the infrastructure creation that just stops and when it stops everything disappeared your your infrastructure you just save whatever you had to save you take your luggage and you leave before everything sinks so whenever someone is using a web page or anything in your applications you just on the fly generate an infrastructure and it just goes away so we're talking about million servers uh, the cloud market is estimated 330 billion euros um, consider it's the same in US dollars in 2020 90% uh, of companies in the world uh, are using cloud computing. Um, Amazon is, of course, taking the head uh, with a uh, market with uh, over 30%. That's the second revenue for Amazon after uh, e-commerce, of course. Um, the average spent per structure in the world is 2.2 million euros for year per year in 2020. So most of these services are provided by Google developers and cloud solutions, um, Amazon Web Services, and Microsoft Azure. Uh, they do, when summed up together, uh, represent 60% uh, of the market share, which is quite a lot, actually. So yeah, and we also think about uh, the Play Store, like the Google Play Store, the Apple Store, the Windows Store, etc. So uh, it's used for many things. Um, um, application hosting, most of the time, that was always the case, you know, uh, just um, spread the loads and balance everything, um, lessen the cost of hosting, uh, um, upgrade and improve response time, serverless with, so we, with Lambda and Amazon, for example, databases uh, to increase uh, complexity and maintenance as they grow up, like try to uh, do build and use a database system for yourself, like by handles hundreds of millions of lines and billions of lines you see by yourself. Uh, big data, of course, uh, to just uh, store and process data, it's just never ending um, IoT because you want to benefit the permanent and close to reliable infrastructure because when you build IoT you have objects that you never come back to they are just somewhere in the world they are sold and you cannot upgrade and maintain those systems so when they want to communicate with something when they are connected objects when they are connecting something there's not it's a computer but you don't have access to it. it's a small thing you know my bulbs right now are connected and when they're trying to connect to the bridge uh, so Philips you bridge so I got a bridge somewhere in the house so this bridge is trying to connect and you, you're not asking Philips or whatever, whoever wants to repair it or a Nest uh, thermostat, you know. You're not asking them to come to your house and repair the thing. It's just once it's sold, it's sold. And this thing is trying to connect to internet. So if it fails, 
you got no more lights. You are just cutting basic systems for people. So it needs to work all the time. That's why cloud computing is good. So it's also used for um, AI, machine learning, like IBM Watson, Google Cloud AI, but many other uh, are doing, doing this too. Uh, you got uh, mass calculations, like super calculators are still a thing, but they're just, they're not the uh, dream machine of everyone anymore. So parallelization is on the way. Uh, there's also quantum calculation in the cloud, uh, like D-Wave is starting to do something really cool, and Google too, you can uh, already subscribe to make uh, some executions on uh, quantum computers for certain calculations, that's cool, that's pretty cool, it's already working right now, it's been working for a year actually. Um, you can also have that um, network abstraction through CDN, content delivery networks, so you just solve the interconnection problem with simplified interfaces and uh, you make sure that resources are closer to where you ask them to be and you have scalability too in cloud like amazon ec2 we have um, applications that are made to grow elastic you know and also you will hear about uh, heroku um, just bought recently by salesforce as a web system deployment application in the cloud that's going to be cool and um Two more things I'd like to talk about. If you want to talk about the problems that lead to NoSQL and systems like Apache Cassandra, we're going to talk about it. Um, last but not the least, we have a very subtle and technology related things related to our domain. The uh, object relational impedance mismatch. That's a pretty long term. Eh? It's just it's like you're not going to. Fuck you talking about? Yeah, it's just uh, like uh, a swearing, but it's not. If we just stop to analyze it, it means there is a non correlation between the relational model on the side and the object model on one side, on the other side. So, uh, you know, object oriented programmation, uh, OOP is a programmation paradigm that tends to um, predate on everything for years already. And uh, even though there's been like a comeback for uh, functional programming recently, uh, you know that application, object-oriented applications um, and tabular applications, yeah, tables, uh, are not really the best way to represent objects in database. So um, the, the linear uh, aspect of relational database don't offer uh, encapsulation, inheritance, polymorphism, and uh, they don't allow using, you know, pointers or references. You just don't use this. You just join everything or you don't have anything. That is not really matching the POO. So to be true, uh, certain DBMS tried to do OOP uh, with pointers also in the years 1990. Uh, was not a good success and we created monsters. Yeah, we created monsters like, I should insert the, you know, the small, little girl crying, shouting in the street, like, yeah! I should have some drama to this. We did recruit in monsters like um, object relational databases like DB2, Cache, uh, Oracle, ORD, or they just, if you don't know about those things, keep doing so, you're on the good way. Uh, it's not a joy every day, you know. Um, theoretical solutions were tried, but more or less abandoned while trying to be, um, Set up. Okay. Also, databases, basis, basically, everything doubles. Doubles every two years. And in the middle of the years 2000, we didn't find an answer to the raising increase of volume storage. Uh, the volume of storage, you know, it's just um, the read and write access became very, very slow. So, like I said, if you have a database on one server, just uh, trying to put indexes, optimizations, uh, scalability um, is not a thing, but just going to repair tables and stuff. And uh, try one million lines on a tenth of columns, a dozen of columns, then try with 10 millions, with 100 millions, and before you hit the billion, you're gonna have your computer melt. Like, you're gonna have a, a pile of melted metal, like a Terminator that just farted or something. Uh, I never say this, right? <laughs> so if you imagine millions of billions of, of hundreds 
of tables, you know, it's just going to be too much. So you see that coming, right? Um, you, you don't, we don't even have, we don't even transfer this on the network, you know. Uh, we estimate the um, total storage on Earth to be already 45 zettabytes. Yeah, that's one billion of billion bytes on Earth. That's already a lot. But if you come to this in 20 years, we're going to say like, hey, that's just my personal computer storage ability, you know. So maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Let's hope so. Uh, so we don't even have the uh, network to translate this right now, like I talked about Amazon Snowmobile. Uh, like the fastest fiber optics on Earth right now, well, as I'm talking, is uh, 500 gigabytes per second, which is already cool actually, <laughs> it's pretty cool, but it's way, way from enough to talk about these database. This is quite a paradox, right? We have the fastest network that is just incredibly fast, and can just burn a, a hard disk drive in one second, but we don't have the data to to the, way, the means to transfer this data. So yeah. So uh, same part of this chaos. Uh, let's talk about how we built um, this kind of infrastructure. Mm. How do we resist all these problems? So. Um, if you had to think, what would you say is a, f is, is a track we can follow to solve the problems of load increase in databases? So take your panties and uh, hold on to them. We're going to make uh, lots of colorful schemas and rectangles and stuff and lines in a row. So yeah. So uh, we know that the base uh, we cannot overcome is the, the capacity of the machine, right? So we have to inject steroids. We can we can just put and add, just inject tons of gigabytes and terabytes of RAMs. Uh, we can just put larger CPUs until it breaks everything and it can just uh, calculate a new Bitcoin in once again. But yeah, we have more and more cores, um, parallel CPUs. It just becomes really expensive to fabricate and um, it just exponentially becomes uh, harder to fabricate instead of taking X machines N machines in the same place, like, you know, uh, sometimes it's going to be more than twice the cost if you want to increase twice the ability for one machine to simply have two machines on the side. We call that vertical scalability. So we just uh, inflate the machine physically on which the applications run. Um, so our basic and fundamental unit for complexity and rezoning is a machine. Like, you know, it's a server, basically. It's going to be a physical server, but we could use these virtual uh, machines, but they just reduce performance and reduce physical resources instead of adding them. So let's just talk about a machine. And this is the second thing we need. It's uh, when we got several machines, we have to make a link between them. We have to uh, link them. So for our disposal, we have network. So we have seven network layers uh, in the in the um, ISO standard model, you know, I think you I hope you remember these seven um, layers, you know, we have protocols for each layer, we have sockets with numbers into a protocol, we have files, uh, simple files or pipes in Unix, for example, we have Unix signals, uh, which is also working in other operating systems. We have remote procedure call. We have shared memory. Uh, you know, when processes um, share the same memory addresses. We have a few variants and we have message queuing too. So one super quick thing about message queuing, if you don't want it, is um, this slide is from another course. Uh, but yeah, the best definition on IBM is a message broker is a software that allows application systems and communication services to interact with each other and exchange information. A message broker accomplishes this task by translating messages between a formalized protocol of messengery uh, and uh, this allows services and applications, uh, including uh, different applications on different technologies to communicate. That's the definition of message broker. So when you build a system, that uses services, microservices, you never know uh, when you can rely on uh, the, the, the load, uh, the current load of uh, and disponibility, availability of your machines. So sometimes you have to scale you up with cloud to make it grow as much as you can. But you also uh, can offer a synchronous uh, processing to 
uh, flatten the curve, you know. So uh, you just, let's say you need to generate um, bills for an application system like e-commerce system and these bills have to call web services so they're taking time so they have to generate pdfs and stuff and if you start a batch that's just regenerating uh, on the fly or 100 bills for example but people are trying to order new things at the same place on the same server if the billing generating process just blocks your io blocks your machine the people will not be able to reach your web server which is quite a bad thing it's quite a pain in the ass you know so you're going to slow down the orders you're going to make people leave your site and you're going to just slow down everything that you could just do later on so there are um, dozens of applications that do this they Basically, they just keep whatever is to be done as tasks in memory. They wait for something to be done and they offer a new thing to say, like they got envelopes, like messages, you know, and so so does it go on, you know. So this allows connecting several machines that will do the, the handle of the, of the process. They're connecting to someone, you know, and basically this is what you have on the schema here. You have what you call a message broker and a producer. So then you have consumers. So actually you have some machines, some things that says, hey, there's something to do, but it's going to take some time. Just please remember, I have to do this. You're not doing this. Like I'm telling you, I have to generate the bill for orders one, three, two, four, five, six. It's all. It's already done. But I summed up the thing. If I were to hand you the bill, it's a whole PDF file with tons of things, you know. So the broker stores the idea that you have to do this and then the consumers uh, can just do the thing one by one and actually when they are done, they say, hey, should I do something else? Um, and the broker say, yeah, I got new things for you. So uh, among the other things and um, what you will hear about the most, you got Amazon SQS, RabbitMQ, of course, and uh, Apache Kafka. Uh, you could use this in certain projects, but that's not the purpose of this thing today. So let's get back to what we were sewing. Okay, so we've got everything now and we talked about all the possible tools we have at disposal. So how to sum up and solve this quantity, um, uh, scattering, uh, reactivity, consistency and partitioning problems. Uh, how could you just do this? I'm pretty sure you got solutions in hand. So. First of all thing, we could share memories. Like, this is good. If you remember this thing, like I told you, this is a machine, right? This white uh, rounded rectangle is the machine. So you've got one memory and you've got several rows. So you have one database system that uses several rows. Could be working, but the thing is, you're just optimizing the reads and the cache. The rest of the time, it's not gonna be really efficient, isn't it? So yeah, second solution is you could share the disk uh, if you do this, you've got a great improvement in I.O. But when you have to go through and when your process has to go through, they're going to have to uh, process the same read and write. So you're not really gaining anything. So then you could be replicating on several machines. Like you could be just using, like you see here, not one, not two, but three, not four machines. Like you got a front dispatcher that is going to say, we're going to round robin, see this. But... If you do this, you have some problems, like you have to synchronize the writes between everything because you're already losing consistency. So then you've got uh, data fragmentation, you know, so we just chart everything. Uh, so you take one server with multiple connections and you have sharding with only part of the data here, another part here, another part here. So you know your database system, you know, which is actually what we call with um, federated uh, stuff on MySQL, I think, MySQL. You just you just um, shard the databases uh, on several machines and this helps the I.O. because the network I.O. is pretty cool and low actually. And then you've got the federated engines uh, that are purely federated where we just got basically a ghost version of a table, the cache, the main DB server and you go to <clears throat> some other um, you go to some other uh, systems to pick up the data so that is a help and you can just uh, have your machines uh, work all together like this okay so then you can do um, not instead of horizontal sharding you can use vertical sharding so you can have 
rows uh, fragmentation into several machines but the thing is still the same if you lose one machine you lose pretty much everything uh, this works actually this works for some data but not for any of them uh, this also for example works for twitter for a long time ago and it was fun you can also uh, have a vertical sharding which is uh, you just store not the tables not the uh, the 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 databases not the tables but inside the table only some columns which is even further um, sharding but here you got always the same problem if one of them goes down you just lose part of the data you can still read you can still read there's consistency on the remaining ones but it just falls down then you can create services that's that's pretty good you know you just uh, know that each base uh, on a on a business point of view, we'll just do less things. So here you got one utility, one service here, another service here, another one. So this workload, these workloads are uh, have already been, you know, scattered on several machines, and you don't have to handle all of them simultaneously. Like you can also cut down the services one by one. This is pretty good, you know. So. In a certain way, we reduced the load per system, but we're going back to the initial problem with one being overloaded, like this second server, table four, five, six here, could just become overloaded. So you're just not really good. So before I just go to the next slide, uh, another thing you have to be aware of is the microservices. Um, this is a, a software architecture concept. Microservices is a word you're gonna hear a lot. Uh, in the beginning of times, long time ago, when everyone was not even born, we used to build applications that were simple in terms of business logic, uh, easy to execute without saturating a machine, and uh, homogeneous with basic concepts, like uh, we used to have more complex concepts for research and science, you know. Uh, the machines were uh, smaller, the millions of instructions per second, the billions of instructions per second was exponentially lower. So we had the idea to decouple uh, beyond the different uh, architecture systems, like we saw on the last slide, for example. Uh, you remember this slide? We just decoupled um, from machine to machine, but here we're just going to decouple inside the uh, system itself. So inside each service we're gonna have sub-services and um, instead of this we're just dissociating uh, not only the technologies but the business part of the application inside the technology. So uh, if you had that PDF thing I was work thinking about and talking about last time, you had this microservice that would be generating the bills and this one would be handling the comments and the front UI and stuff like this. So that would be different, and of course you can have different uh, machines for this, okay? So yeah, you don't saturate your system until everything is saturated, which of course is indirectable, so yeah. Uh, just remember, um, if you build a system after one second, a human will know that the system is changing. After three seconds, people will just start being impatient, and we are just breaking the thought flow and the thought process of someone and after 30 seconds you are losing the user for real. Uh, if you want to know more about this you should uh, check the Google works on Rail, R-E-R-A-I-L. -E um, uh, on the subject, it's pretty interesting, you got pretty good talks on this subject on the internet, especially what they thought about when, when, when they were building AMP, so that's pretty good. Uh, the idea is just to scatter and, um, you know, make this uh, distributed uh, application uh, on several environments. But you note, uh, you have parallel executions possible now. So you can execute service per technology, but also per, per functionality. Uh, you can create a service for billing and whatever I told you. So yeah, uh, the idea of microservices is that you create weekly couple services that are as most uh, as much independent uh, one from the others as you can you know so there could be services that depend one each other but for who the, 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 for which the, the task they are are on machines that are dimensioned um, according to what they need to produce and the loads so this is more economical actually uh, the paradigm of uh, microservices is to fluidify the load and um, attribute resources where and when you need it, but also maintain smaller 
uh, source code basis, which is potentially uh, simpler and more independent. So yeah, and also the, the, the streams and services flux uh, are based on APIs, um, standard messages that your microservices are going to exchange uh, with how they could talk to each other. So a solution, a uh, special dedicated to this, uh, we can have a microservice architecture. So we, we hear that we actually, we um, distributed the load pretty easily and pretty good. Uh, we see that it's just already better on an application level, but we are not really uh, distributing the database level. It's still the same thing. We still have this database thing. So this is a scalable solution. Uh, we can imagine that, for example, if this is not subject to changing every day, App Server 1 can be replicated like 10 times and we can have different nodes and a load balancer that we just interrogate one of them at random, like round robin, whatever you want to be. It's going to be pretty efficient actually. So yeah, but I talked about uh, message queuing and message brokers um, a few slides ago. This is the moment and the place where you insert message brokers here by just communicate with this service. So actually you can have several copies of one. So um, that those were the first ideas and how you distribute a database. And yeah, if you find, if you look at the market, you found some great names who distribute the system. Um, Owner systems, uh, resource systems, open source, and I'm just not going to mention anything, but there's over a hundred of database, uh, non relational database systems that are actually maintained and working. So you got a lot of them actually on this uh, on this list. All right, so let's go into the sheet. What, what, what are we talking about? What is Cassandra? What, what is Cassandra addressing? So remember we saw um, the problems we had, we saw what a database is, what the problems are right now with the CB theorem and stuff like this. We saw the solutions, the potential architecture solutions we have and how to handle this, but we didn't see everything and that's why we need to see what Cassandra is. So let's go. What is Cassandra? Uh, first of all things, to just wipe out uh, the Cassandra history. Uh, let's just go for a quick reminder what this is, uh, the history of this DBMS. Uh, in 2006, Google uh, published a big table paper uh, that just explained uh, how to solve the growing storage limitations like for email, web search. Uh, of course, I'm not doing the uh, complete history, but you know, I told you already when the databases were invented in the 1970s for Oracle. Uh, we've got um, first commercial database uh, here. You got IBM models first to the first object-oriented databases that I told about. Uh, SQL becomes a standard um, in ANC in uh, 1986. And ISO in 1997. Oh, I was three years old at school. And the first use of NoSQL term was uh, in a paper of 1998 in an article. So yeah, I was talking about the Google um, Big Table paper, 2006. And I was talking about the uh, Dynamo paper in 2007. Those are really close papers uh, to lay the fundamentals of how you conceive systems that are reliable, uh, that have a good performance and that are always available. Uh, so we just had the basis for a few years, but we just didn't connect everything. And this was a basis for um, Rayek, for example, or Voldemort, not the bad guy in, in, in Harry Potter, but it's just inspired from his name for LinkedIn, for example, LinkedIn created Voldemort at this time. The idea was to replace a solution that just uh, was handling the, the basket, the, 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 the cart, the shopping cart on Amazon.com. So Amazon had this problem. And uh, the good thing is uh, DynamoDB from Amazon doesn't even use what they used and what they wrote in the Dynamo papers, but it's close, they say, they call it Dynamo. So in 2008, um, there was an open source uh, paper and things that was out uh, on Cassandra, the Cassandra papers and uh, Facebook emerged with a solution that they just had. They used for several years and they decided to open source their thing. Uh, there was a Cassandra paper on um, storage in Cassandra and it was accepted um, the, the next year, the, the, the next year on 2009, uh, as an, an Apache um, open source project. And uh, it just 
Basically, Cassandra uses the two papers uh, mentioned before. It uses the uh, Dynamo distributed paper on one side and the big table from Google on another side. So, yeah. And uh, one of the authors of this paper is uh, Avinash Lakshman, who is one of the authors of uh, DynamoDB, of Amazon's Dynamo. So, yeah. So, at a glance, Cassandra is a solution that good guys and large guys, the giants of the IT had had like 10 years before we had those uh, problems actually. So this is uh, why the, the, uh, the, the, um, the Cassandra papers are doing right now. This is what they are. They are um, the, the resolution of things that, that, that people had way before we do have these problems. But right now we're starting to have this. So as a very, very fast and large scale, uh, what do we have to remember from um, Cassandra? Uh, uh, um, <laughs> what? Uh, oops, sorry. I just need to remove that shit. Um, that was my... That was my Discord channel. All right. Um, what does uh, Cassandra uh, do? Um, I'm going to close Chrome, actually, because I'm going to forget about this shit at some point. Uh, and Discord, too. All right. So what does... And Slack, too. I got everything open right now. What does Cassandra do? Um, it's a system that uses a distributed system with node roles. Uh, it uses protocols to dynamically allow server pooling and communication. It uses replication through different strategies. Uh, it allows geographical and logical scattering, uh, like data centers. Uh, it allows synchronous I.O., consistency, fine-tuning. It um, enables entropy resistance through self-repairing, because the system repairs itself. It comes with built-in data compaction and optimization tools because you're going to need those. And um, also it offers a query language, which is named CQL, Cassandra query language, inspired from uh, SQL syntax. Yay, that's going to be good. Uh, so we just know a few things already. And it relies on an immutable data storage format. We're going to talk about this. And it has no single point of failure. There's no master, master and slave. Uh, all the nodes are peer-to-peer. -peer. So let's go. Um, if you look, Cassandra is uh, raising like very, very often in terms of um, DBMS as the most uh, popular and used DBMS. So if you want to just uh, look like you were a tough guy, uh, this is uh, for the people who would adopt the interest of this technology. So yeah, you've got basically everyone knows about it. You got Apple in head. So Apple uses a cluster of, last time it was reported by them, it was 150,000 Cassandra nodes. Yes, those are servers. <laughs> and I mean by that, they are physical servers more than probably. So yeah, they do handle um, 10 millions uh, in terms of magnitude of queries per second. Yes, this is tens of millions of queries per second. It's just fucking broken. <laughs> and, and yes, that's uh, uh, petabytes of data storage. So you got Netflix also, which is very famous, like um, several tens of thousands of Cassandra nodes on hundreds of clusters. They do handle the same uh, tens of tens of millions of queries per second, um, like uh, ex uh, exabytes, petabytes of data on, on, on storage. It's going to be growing all the time and never going to do it. So yeah. They got the same number of requests per day, and they say they have approximately uh, a few gigabytes to a few terabytes per node. So yeah. Then you've got the CRN in Europe, uh, which um, helped the, um, building the LHC, which helped um, setting up the evidence of the um, of the um, in large hadron collider of the uh, boson of Higgs. So we had had uh, we got like an incredible amount of data, and we've got also other people using it: Instagram, eBay, 
this nice Cisco Sand Cloud Sony many more whatever um, many video games like Call of Duty uh, many of them Activision Blizzard uses too uh, actually 30 percent of the Fortune Sand uh, 13 100 index are using Cassandra so yeah it's still scarcely a little used in Facebook and Twitter nowadays even though they switch to some other systems so yeah so it's time to uh, make more schemas. We're gonna make simple schemas and we're gonna make them progressively more interesting. So don't hesitate to stop me if it's complex or if we go back in time uh, as much as we need to, okay? So it's pretty important that you understand there are uh, always several elements to understand when you just go for a new technology. Uh, the concepts behind how to build architectures with these concepts and manipulating technology. Okay, so we just um, saw the concepts that led to building technologies like this one. Now we're going to see the concepts to answer this problematic and how Cassandra works because Cassandra is not a, it's often a software only, it's a solution and as often with jobs you have to set up the solutions not only to give tools and languages but to talk about solutions in a whole. So this is the basis of what Cassandra is. It's a node. Yeah. So this one is pretty alone. Sad. You know, it never happens. A, a, a single node is just uh, when you want to test something on your own computer, you just don't have the time to build a whole cluster because you don't give a fuck. But you want to test like input and output with a Cassandra cluster. And okay, so uh, when you go to production, it's a whole different world. Okay. So remember, we had symbolized that there would be a physical machine, okay? So the node is um, symbolized into a physical machine. So we could have several nodes per physical machine, but you don't really get a lot for this. You can, you can, it is possible, but it's not really what you want it to be. So yeah, the node uh, has data and uh, we call this data uh, a petition. Uh, this is called, this is stored on a physical engine, like a hard disk storage, you know, or SSD, a mount, external storage, whatever you want it to be, but in the end it just comes on physical storage. And this petition has data, but you don't really store the data only, you also calculate how to index this data with a hash. And the hash function, if you don't know it, is just a, a, math, a math function that you apply. And whatever you put as an input, it always gives the same result as an output. And it's very, usually, usually uh, very hard to calculate. So the hash function used by Cassandra is murmur hash free. So each token uh, is a summed up 64 bit hash. Uh, yes, I counted and you've got 64 bits uh, in this <laughs> in each of these numbers. So yeah, each token in the hash table is a is a 64 bits number. Uh, okay. And each token has a hash value that it, you don't need it to be uh, unique or whatever. It's probably unique. Uh, it's more than probably unique. Like uh, the hash value has a certain probability of giving a non unique uh, result but it's just impossible. It's, you, you just get no chance. There's absolutely no chance that you will find two similar hash things in the hash table. So, okay, so you got this token range into a node. So, so far, the node has 100% of the token hashes, so it has 100% of the data. Remember, this is just a hash, but you also have a data stored next to the hash, okay? So, also, just to make a little more complex, uh, Cassandra handles what they call virtual nodes, and virtual nodes are just a way to virtually um, split tables into into several subtables. That's just uh, basically to um, optimize further load repetition. So, if you have um, if you have like distribution um, system of yours and you want to have data scattered on several servers. If you just insert one or two lines, uh, if you have just like 100 nodes, uh, you have to um, you have to move all the lines, one or two lines on 100 nodes. That's just 99% um, servers concerned by movement. That's not really good. No, you don't want to do this. So. To make the things more fair, you cannot go under those virtual nodes, so you don't have to move all the data slightly one by one. You just move what is necessary uh, when the servers want to update each other. So you have a um, 
uh, not completely exact similar responsibility, but it's close to it, okay? So remember, uh, this node is really alone, even though, you know, it's storing the data, right? You know, in the data, as you saw on the schema, is ordered, right? There's, there's an order here, like you got this, this hash tokens and it's pretty good and it's pretty good holders, you know, 0, 1, 100, 1, 20, okay? So this node is single. It's uh, it's lonely. It's a sad node, you know, it's just crying right now. What are we doing? Uh, we're just going to add friends. So so we're just going to add friends, more pals, you know, um, people who are good and they don't have the same data. So um, just remember this node, uh, this circles here is a physical motion right i don't i'm not i stop, stop drawing physical motions right now because you know it's one of them but it's just one node okay and what we're going to do is uh these nodes are still lonely so we're going to make them talk to each other so bing 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 and bing that's called peer-to-peer -peer because all the nodes are on a similar level no one is a master no one's a slave and boom we just created a cassandra cluster wow that's cool let's go in so um as you remember we have determined that a node uh, had all the data. So uh, in, in addition to having uh, to store the results, the hash tables to know, uh, to quickly identify uh, the data, okay? So if you want to identify the data quickly, you just have a hash, which is which is why the hash is there. It's not for the sole pleasure of adding columns. You just have the hash because you want to know where your data is uh, located, okay? Uh, right now, all connected is con our node is not single anymore. It's cool. He's got friends, but he's still uh, a little selfish. You know, he's got all the data. But the purpose of Cassandra is to uh, balance the data and to distribute it over a network. So let's go. Let's distribute the data. So um, I'm gonna go with hashes from zero to hundred because if I had to name this zero one 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 zero 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 one one zero zero, it's just gonna be too long, right? So even if I gave you the decimal equivalent of this number, it's gonna be way too long. So I'm just going to sum up and say, let's pretend these numbers, these especially long numbers here, are just hashes ordered from 0 to 25, 26 to 50, 51 to 75, and 76 to 100. Okay, we just scatter, we split things anyway. Just remember, it's 64 bytes. It could be up to 18 billions of billions uh, number in decimal that is a uh, is a little long actually i'm not gonna name them all okay so here we just diminished and reduced the storage uh, needs for each node by four so we could store we could add for storage and store four times more that's one of the key aspects of cassandra uh, we're going to talk about this the scaling is linear if you just want to store twice as much data you will need twice as many servers okay so looking at this schema you're gonna say hey bro you just uh you're good but you're just mocking us you know you're just uh this is just sharding like this this is really sharding you know there's, no, there's nothing new here so if we just lose node 2 for example uh, we just lose, lose everything that is here it's just uh Incomplete, right? We should have done load balancing, but uh, we don't know how to communicate with this server also. So that's a lot of mystery. So let's solve all these two mysteries, okay? So the first one is called replication and second is called node rules. So what is replication? Hey, let's just say we're not only going to store the primary table, the primary part of the table well, of which the node is responsible, but we're gonna give him another mission. We're gonna give him, hey, Note, you're gonna store another replicate of another segment of data. Like, you're gonna store the, the data from someone else. Uh, so we're gonna redress this schema so it's actually uh, um, more right in this part. Don't, don't look at me, it was really a pain in the ass to make this schema, so yeah. <laughs> um, we just decide on arbitrarily well, that uh, each node is going to store a quarter of data which is not his data. So, uh, don't first of all things uh, a quarter is not a mandatory thing. It's just uh, an example, okay? In in our example, it's just a minimum. So we are uh, remember we are we are an, at an era of which storage doesn't cost anything. The terabyte is just free falling down in terms of costs, and the hard disks are lasting longer than they used to. So, despite the ecological crisis we are crossing, um, like billions 
of servers is just not a really ecological solution. We have to cool them, recycle air, recycle materials. Um, we have to provide energy. That's really not good. So if you look at this schema, you say is um, what, what you say. You say it's pretty good, but we double the storage quantity. It's not. It's not perfect. Um, so, so each store, each server now is stores the half of the total data. Uh, but I just seeing it. Uh, how many replicates do we need? How many servers? For how many servers? So uh, what if what if I just tell you uh, this is not really good with four servers? Cassandra is not really good with four servers, right? Uh, isn't it just because it's just my, a bad example because I didn't have the place, the room to draw more? Yes, it is. So normally you would say, hey, since uh, everything is linked to the number of replicates. What is a good ratio between servers and replicates? So that's a good question. And uh, the explanations hold in research papers that were done years ago and that are more or less complex to read. And fundamental mathematical research like probability and, and quantity on the some on some side. And um, on another side, research on, on computing material, um, how long they can last uh, replaced uh, being replaced or structures the um, hardware redundancy the backups the cost etc so yeah so what's uh, in your opinion the correct number and the correct number is not dependent on nodes and the quantity uh, of things to be stored this is just um, uh, a ratio between complexity and security and cost so uh, if you just uh, are going to be paranoid you're just going to raise the number of replicates so you can choose how many you want to set with Cassandra. But remember, uh, if you just go uh, towards a, a global power surge or a network complete breakdown, it's just going to be a nightmare, whatever you do. But if you are trying, stress, trying to be uh, saving, uh, if you are trying to be saving, uh, you try to tend to zero replicates and you lose all the storage security concepts because if one node goes down, everything dies. So yeah, the good number, the good solution is three. The good replication factor, the ideal one is three. Whatever your size, the size of your cluster is. So it's the default value when you use Cassandra and you create a cluster. So yeah, with four servers, you don't see it very well. You say like, ah, it's robust, but okay, we saved one quarter of the storage or oh, close to it with the token storage, but it's just nothing in terms of storage. But you could just add way many more nodes than this one, you know. Uh, but you should never put um, more replicas than you have nodes. You can do this, but it's not really, really useful. And uh, it, it really just uh, counterproductive. Uh, it just ends up being counterproductive. You're just losing things. You're slowing down your system. But just imagine what it would do, uh, what it would be if we just had 20 nodes like a ring. I'm, I'm putting a ring because Cassandra Networks works like a ring, okay? Uh, it's a token ring, basically. Uh, each of the nodes has 120 of primary data and each one node also holds 220 of replica data. So in the total place, you have uh, 3 out of 20 busy place with that and uh, you basically got 17 out of 20 uh, data saved. So with a replication factor of three, uh, that's pretty good. So on my example schema here, you got not three, that's holding the primary things. And you got three replicates in total. We got 13, 12, and 14. Everything, every one of them is just a basic replica of all the functions. So they know where they are. This one is the primary node, but you don't really give a damn fuck about this one. So also Cassandra offers uh, a decomposition uh, level, uh, decomposing level which is just way below the one of cluster, is the one of data center. So it's a way, I would say, to match your physical data center, which is the location they are on Earth. Um, like there's no Amazon or Google server in the street. They are uh, in uh, warehouses. This is where they are precisely on Earth, so you could just um, group this in config node configuration. So, so for example, here uh, we could say that we had data center uh, based on network proximity. For example, if you just have data center one here in San Francisco, the two in London, three in Singapore, and four Melbourne, we're gonna be 
pretty surprised in terms of network latency, right? So if you're in Paris, you're going to have 50 milliseconds, uh, 15, uh, 180, and 220 milliseconds. If you're in Sydney, you're going to have 250, 130, 30, and 50 milliseconds, right? So it will depend on network topology and the, the space and the network space and geography that separates not from each other. So I just put some uh, dotted lines here just to illustrate which connection you could create but you could just potentially create any form of connection so if i put them all the schema would be just plain white um so uh with cassandra we are making all the nodes communicate in permanence uh, all the time you know it's just uh, they are just communicating over they are just really chatting a lot and uh, remember in the data center you have less than 10 milliseconds if not less than one millisecond ping so pretty good actually so i just put uh for that center but yeah uh, and even though, more than this, Cassandra can offer data center in different cloud providers. Yeah, you can imagine this one, the data center one is in, for example, Amazon Web Services, these ones two and three could be uh, on Google Cloud, and the third, last one could be uh, hosted locally, Windows, Azure, whatever you want it to be, so it's pretty good. So if we just uh, connect to the one which is at Amazon, for example, is going to replicate the instruction towards another data center, which is going to retake the process and do it themselves, and all of them are going to do this all together. How? Let's talk about this. So, also, uh, just to finish on the basic structure on the network, you can also use a finer notion, which is called rack. Because the rack, you know what it is, is just uh, this bay in uh, an open an open uh, shelf in, um, in a storage um, warehouse. It's just a rack, it's just uh, several servers in a row. You know, we just put them inside with, uh, with racks, basically. That's just what you need, you know, um, with drawers, like. And uh, the thing is, uh, if you lose a machine like a rack, uh, you could lose a whole uh, a whole um, colon of storage, yeah? so you could lose a whole rack. Uh, that's not really perfect and not ideal because if you have all the nodes in the same place, you just don't want to do it. So um, let's imagine right now we're losing, uh, I don't know, six, seven, and eight, for example, uh, and these four servers are going down. Uh, you lose all the data that was on them. So the problem is if both were replicates, there's no more place in the whole data center to store this. If those are replicates, you can have replicates here, here, and here, but this is going to be disconnected. So it's not really ideal because you have to reconnect and rebuild the data on any servers. So yeah, but if we had put the data and if we have distributed the data on, let's say seven and five, for example, and five or five, six, seven, we could just have six and seven go down, but five would still be working. We had one last chance, but it's still working, okay? So um, to, to make Cassandra determine how the nodes are um, named as replicates, you can uh, determine cleverly uh, how to dodge this problem uh, on basis on providing uh, Cassandra the explanation on which machine is in which rack, server, data center, or cluster. And I say server because you can put several nodes on the same server, but it's just something you don't want to do. So yeah, uh, of course, this is a free option. You can just use it as much as you want. And it doesn't have to reflect your physical network. It's just that, for example, if you want to use uh, floors, like first floor, second floor, third floor, etc., you can just do whatever you want. Welcome to the physical world. So yeah, this would be a trick, but we'll just tell about this maybe later on. So to tell Cassandra how it should determine where the things are um, stored, it's going to use snitches, which is uh, a pretty good thing. A snitch uh, is a strategy to know what to put where. So Cassandra has several of them. It has simple snitch, uh, which just shows the next adjacent um, nodes. It has dynamic snitch, where you just uh, monitor the performance and uh, the reading time of replicates to find the best one in the history. Uh, based on history um, operations, you have rack inferring snitch, so you just check the IP addresses and you try to guess which one is in which rack. You have the property file snitch, which is going to be the same, except you don't look at IP addresses, you just look at the configuration file. Uh, there's a specific configuration file, etc. for that. And then you have the gossip property file snitch, which just uh, updates 
with the protocol gossip. The one is called gossip is the protocol Cassandra used to make all the nodes communicate with each other. They just uh, update automatically by determining which one is going to be the best one. This is the production recommended thing for Cassandra because it's basically the, last, the best uh, way to uh, handle your data centers. So, and of course, you got specific uh, snitches like uh, EC2, multi region uh, EC2, uh, Google Cloud, and Cloud Stack. So, yeah, okay. So uh, this is cool, but how we just write into this thing? So just like I told you, the, ri the rings, there's uh, just a token ring, okay? So consistent hash, they are used for this. Uh, you can connect to any node. Uh, so the nodes are servers, and you reference them by their IP address. Uh, then by the TCP port, which the CTP socket is 9042. But we can change it, of course. And this is destined to external drivers. So, you can connect to not only one node, but any node. You can just precise and, 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 and tell your drivers, your application, that all the 20 nodes can be connected here. You can just give the IP address of all these 20 nodes, and it's going to pick one uh, in a pretty good way. Uh, so, like uh, Java, Go, JavaScript, whatever you want it to be, your application system on the side is going to try to connect, okay? So, you can use DNS to find one, then, but if you just use DNS, make sure your DNS server doesn't fall down because you'll just lose like, everything. So, okay. Um, when you configure an app, you just don't give one node, but several nodes, a handful of nodes. You don't have to put the whole cluster. So, we could do this, it's not bad, but just putting a handful of them is just enough, usually, okay? Uh, except if you just plan to change all the servers at a row or uh, you just plan to never give them the same IP address, which is not really clever. Uh, okay, this is something you could possibly do, okay? So just imagine we are connecting to the number seven because it was the closest one, okay? Uh, the success uh, of connection is good with TCP and uh, you write, you say, hi, I want to something. Uh, let's say that the hash would be 45 and uh, we had uh, hashes from 0 to 200, okay? 10 per node, okay? Uh, so we had um, uh, 0, 10, uh, 11, 20, etc., okay? Uh, so the driver is going to say, oh, we need not 7, okay? Because this uh, is among all those four ones, it's going to pick up this one because this one is the fastest repounding, okay? So it's going to say, uh, okay, I'm going to answer on this one and then Node 7 is going to say, whoa, I know, I know, uh, it's going to be a coordinator node. So it's what it's called, the node role is going to be a coordinator node. It's going to pass responsibility to another node to say, hey, uh, I want to write on you and um, let's do this. So it's going to try to determine which one is the most um, habilitated to, 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 to proceed the request and that's been done. So yeah, uh, the nodes are going to communicate with each other uh, because at every single time on Cassandra, every node knows the exact topology of the network. Every time someone new comes into play and say, hey, I'm a new node into the ring, it's going to be inserted and every node is going to be in form of that just lightning fast, okay? So uh, lightning fast updates and uh, it doesn't have a data right now, but it knows where to find them. So each node knows where to find data, like what token range, okay? It knows which partition interval uh, goes from which token value to which token value, and it knows about which partition with primary um, intervals and replicas have, so it's good. Um, in the end, it's not a huge overhead. It's just uh, very little data sold by Cassandra. It's not a lot of overhead. I mean, if you just have a, a huge table with no lines, uh, like zero lines, uh, maybe Cassandra is doing overhead. Otherwise, uh, it's just not. So you could be taking it with a random number, like round robin. Uh, also, you can just um, ask Cassandra to pick up as the driver to pick up the the uh, node that uses uh, primary partition all the time uh, if you want to so uh, in this case uh, if not seven had uh, to answer uh, it just becomes a coordinator if it was just like i don't know 70 to be a coordinator it would just name coordinate 17 as coordinator so the driver would just pass the connection all along and i just made this uh, dashed connection to just mean that it could be another node or not, okay? Uh, depending what you want it to be. It's just the same for read and write. So let's just talk about the writes first. Um, just say that it was node 7. 
named as coordinator, yay, he's happy. So Node 7 says, I'm going to be coordinating everything. So even 7 has the hash in its primary partition, or it's just going to be another one. So it has to find the replicates. So it uses the gossip connection with TCP port 7000 by, uh, by default. So the nodes are going to communicate, all of them, 19, 18, 20, everything, until they find out, okay? They're going to communicate and say, who's got the data? And uh, the two nodes that are storing um, replicates, 2 and 12, for example, uh, remember, we put a, replica a replication factor of 3 by default, we could change this, so we have 3, the main one, and 2 more, that's 3 replicas, okay? So Cassandra tries to usually keep the adjacent nodes as replicas, but we can imagine that we disconnected some machines and we reconnected some machines, so Cassandra just improvised and say, all right, I'm just going to add this one and this one, because i got no idea. So yeah, let's say it, it finds out on 14 and this one's two replicates. All right, we're just going on. So then the node uh, who is responsible uh, for the primary task is going to execute a local uh, writing task on its petition, okay? Because we're talking writing right now, and it's going to uh, be responsible for a return a validation to the driver. So uh, normally he will just then write the data locally. Remember, everything here is asynchronous. It's just a promise. He's promising he's going to do this. He's storing everything he needs to do and says, "All right, I got the data. I've got what I need to do. I've got all I need to write. I'll write when I got the time." And it's logically, he's going to feed back to the driver uh, an answer a response that's going to say, uh, it's done, OK? Uh, and then the driver would just return the promise that it's been done to the replicates. And then the node is going to dispatch things, things into the other nodes and synchronously try to write into them. And then the nodes are going to acknowledge by saying, hey, I'm done, too. It's good. So in the end, our hash 45, what you want to be, is in the nodes and uh, in the main node and the replicas that we liked it from, from this. Okay, so the, the, the protocols are self organized to determine who's handing the request, who's writing the, the, the things, who's communicating to write replicas, and to return the value, say, yeah, we just wrote. Okay, so the problem here, this is the longest slide, I think, is what Cassandra calls writing um, and how Cassandra decides that something is written or not. Just remember, uh, we're talking about potentially very big clusters with a large mass of data uh, that we need to process and a complete time to write before there's a delay before the next writing, okay? So the idea is have three structural elements. The history, the physical history of what is being done, of what has to be written, that is very fast and unorganized, just Pile, okay, it's a pile, okay, it's just a pile. It's very fast itself, it's just here to make sure that nothing is lost. And this is what we call the commit long, okay, so, it, uh, and the mem table. So we just also need uh, a, mem a, a, a temporary RAM instance, like to just have the latest changes that will just later be written on the disk. And of course, we got the disk, the SS table, okay, so here I just put these things outside the node, but I should be writing this inside the node, okay? That's just, it's it's complicated to be writing this like this. I think, I mean, this circle should be englobing everything actually, but it's not what I meant to be. Let's just say this is uh, symbolically a node, okay? This is just node mechanics. Um, but if you have a, let's say a writing um, request coming from your side, hey, that's my client data, I'm coming from the network, there's a driver that says, write this shit down. And the first thing Cassandra is doing is to write it down to the commit log. Okay, so this data is coming in, and it's gonna be absorbed by this. And first thing is a commit log. A commit log is a waiting file, you know, it's just, uh, it's just um, a waiting line. Uh, read only, it's gonna be mutations that had to be done to local tables to the node. So it just says, you're gonna have to write this to this table at some point. And uh, it's going to be launched in first uh, before anything else goes further. So Cassandra receives this to say, okay, I'm instantly storing this to a commit log. So when it first starts, Cassandra uh, has everything in the commit logs or mem tables. Okay. And when Cassandra finds out uh, it's time to write, 
is going to empty mem tables into SS table. Okay, so there's two ways of determining how to use the commit log uh, because I'm going to go from this to this and this to this. Uh, you can uh, use the batch mode, which Cassandra waits for things to be really written in the commit logs, or you can just have periodic um, answers. So Cassandra, the, the server here, is just going to return, yes, that's done, all, all, all the time at once. And the commit logs are just synchronized later on, okay? So it's put into RAM or something, but it's not memtable. Okay? It's just put here at some point into the internal RAM of Cassandra and saying, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to write to the commit log, but it's just, okay, I did it. Consider that I did, okay? So you can choose between writing first, acknowledging then, or saying that you're going to do it, and so This is already synchronous, even <laughs> inside a node. So yeah, it's pretty good. Um, so then you just synchronize the commit logs uh, x, uh, every x milliseconds to make sure that the writing has to be taken into account. So when the commit logs writing is just um, have arrived to the final tables, uh, Cassandra can archive, recycle <coughs> the commit logs recordings and do whatever we want it to. It wants to be with them. Okay. So then, uh, like I say, just right now, it's just said I'm going to write to this commit log and return that everything's done. Okay. But nothing is done. Actually, that's the magic. Then Cassandra says, Ooh, I'm going to put everything into mem table. Mem tables are tables into memory. Oh, that's a great thing. That's why you call mem table, right? So this is memory, okay? This is on disk and this is on memory. So then Cassandra is going to say, okay, everything's going to go to the mem table. It's just uh, there's one mem table per physical table. So it's just a writing buffer or reading buffer, both of them actually, uh, read write data where Cassandra is going to stick everything that's going to be done. Okay, It represents what has to be on the disk one day. Not now, but later. Okay, So if you want to know, there are a small, mm, tiny portion of the final tables. It's the portions that are not yet effective, a segment of tables that have not been effectively written on this okay so that if you ask Cassandra what to do is gonna retrieve in mem tables and SS table at the same time okay so yeah that's what it work so uh, these mem tables are filled when the commit logs are, are, are full when this is full this is get dumped in the mem tables okay there's one uh, at least one in each uh, node of course because you have to have table stuff you know but um, yeah, so usually uh, they are emptied also when you need to have lo space in the commit logs or when the mem tables is full, you got the mem table written to SS table. Okay, so that this, this goes from here to here to here all the time. So it's just here to here to here. One, two, three, four. Okay, so um, what, what this does is it ensures that everything's going to be written first, saved first, and then handled later. Okay. So um, when usually the mem tables writing is done, that's the moment Cassandra is considering that everything is done. You don't need to write into the disk. That, that's the new thing. You're not writing into the disk and saying, I saved your data. There's no arrow, you know, looking, go, going for requests outside bound to stables. You have to go through mem tables. Okay. It just says, that's good. It's done. It's, it's just done. Okay. I've got it in my mem table. I don't need anything else. And uh, when the mem tables are filled, like I just told you, we just ask Cassandra typically when you want to start the server or you want, you have a manual command to do this in the uh, shell, in the Unix shell, you can do this. Force Cassandra to dump the mem table and write on the tables, okay? Uh, so uh, when you do this, Cassandra puts everything on the physical tables. Uh, and Cassandra will start writing physically things. There again, it is periodic and asynchronous, which is really amazing. <laughs> so the writing on disk is going to happen in this precise order. Cassandra tries to glue up the pieces of SS tables that should be written, the physical tables that are just called SS tables, okay? The SS table is the name of the engine of Cassandra. 
and uh, is going to be reorganized in the order you want to have for your column families. Uh, column families is just the name of tables, Cassandra, okay? So the, the logical table, what you have in MySQL, for example, it's called table. Uh, Cassandra is actually having a column family. The SS table are immutable. It means they don't change. You just recreate them and you delete the other ones. That's why it's pretty hard to do, actually. So Cassandra is going to create a portion, you know, of tables with old data plus the new data. Could be also deletions, modifications, whatever. So it could be updates, insert, deletes, whatever, upserts. Um, it just then reconstitutes a new table with everything in order. So new data, all the time, new data, all the whatever it needs to be, how many times you want it to be, depending on the main table size. And then it starts a process named compaction, which is a, a process where it just compacts all the data in one and eliminates the overhead. And then it just changes the pointer. So the old table is useless, the new table, because this one, and then poof, it shoots away the old SS tables and frees some disk space, which is cool. Uh, also, please note, the SS tables can be directly streamed, uh, written or read, uh, especially when the nodes need to replicate each other. When you start a new node and you say, hey, uh, I need a replication factor of three, one node was shut down, and you say, please update this node from the data of the two other ones, they're going to say, all right, let's go. So Cassandra in this, in this place, in this moment, is not going to go for mem tables and commit log because this is huge. So they're going directly to um, replicate the data from SS table from physical storage to physical storage, okay? Um, all right, and uh, this is also uh, mention of something I like to mention that uh, one SS table is not one file, of course, because some um, file system don't handle it. Um, Cassandra has lots of sub files for each table and also uses metadata file like data index, index summary, bloom filter, we can talk about this, compression data, statistics, and control some snacks, things like that. So Cassandra stores metadata uh, in addition to storing the data itself. Okay, but not a lot, just a little, okay? And now there's a problem. Uh, as a developer, you want to know if your data was written or read correctly. And as we saw, everything is fucking asynchronous. So you have to be sure what's going to happen, right? So if you go too fast, you're going to write data. And then you're going to read data just behind your readings. And uh, your data is not here. Oh, that's bad. So if you want to avoid that, you have to uh, master this. Actually, it's mandatory. You have to tell Cassandra what you want to do. So you have to generate requests queries for reading, writing, you have to add, in addition to the requests, parameters that are prerequisites of consistency. So just remember, uh, we saw above a few hours ago, uh, we're going to have the need for consistency. So since consistency cannot be achieved 100%, we're going to complement the request, the query, the, what we're going to do, with a consistency parameter. So what does it do concretely? We're just going to specify how Cassandra cluster is going to determine if the data is consisting, consistent or not when it just answers us. So you can have one node that does the job alone or a group of nodes that will be voting and saying, do you agree on everything is done? Do you, did you all have the same data? So of course, this is better. You raise the consistency, you are starting to have something like a really good consistency. And when the nodes vote together, we call that a quorum, which is a minimum number of voting members. And thanks to the Gossip protocol, they will just self-organize. So the coordinator dispatches everything, so the requests, to the different nodes. And for that, you can have several levels of consistency. Um, so you, I just written all of them. So a quorum is just uh, a 50% plus one uh, rounded less, rounded low, okay? Uh, number of voters. So you have them, I put them all the schema here. So if you say all, this is the slowest one, but if this is 100% consistency, Cassandra is going to write to all the nodes it can write to. Okay, so you, if you ask this, you want to have Cassandra write to all the single nodes. It's Pretty ideal is what you're used to, but it's really slower. If you want to have each quorum, it's going to be a quorum of replica nodes in each data center, which means each data center is going to have an answer to say, yep, 
I wrote it down. If you have, remember, four data center, three servers, that's 12 servers that needs to be written. If you say all, all of them are going to answer yes, and then you're going to have the feedback saying reward. If you want to have uh, each quorum, we have to a quorum, like people agreed that they that, that they wrote, like two of them wrote, for example, in each data center. That's a little less. Uh, quorum means you have the same thing of nodes, but across all data centers. So if you have just uh, um, four data centers or three nodes, if you want to have a quorum, you just need three of them. So if one node in data center one, one node in data center one, and one node in data center four, just wrote the request, you say, all right, that's a local, that's a, a quorum. So we got everything. Then you've got a local quorum, which is uh, you want nodes to um, say, hello, we did the request you asked us, but into a same uh, data center. So that's quite useful, actually. The core Chrome is pretty good, actually. It just means one data center is OK. Then you replicate to the other data centers, which is pretty good, actually. Then you got three, two, and one, which is at least three nodes should answer whatever they call, whoever want, I don't give a fuck. Two of them and one of them anywhere. Local one is uh, really bad. It's just at least one replica node in the current data center. So it just means whatever you are, you just want to have one node answering you. That's the minimum you can do. And uh, this is, those are um, moments where it's written in the commit logs and into the mem tables. But like I said, Cassandra can just acknowledge and doesn't have to even write the commit logs. This is very dangerous because it's written in a very specific thing that is just on the side. Uh, and at least one node has a hinted handoff, and a hinted handoff is this thing I told you about, that I just, I'm going to write to the commit logs. And uh, so Cassandra responses and say, okay, problem is if you just wait for too long, you got the hinted handoffs disappear. If you just shut down the servers, everything's lost too. So any is just really, really bad. You shouldn't use it, it's really weird. So yeah, uh, to finish and to sum up, I just imagine right now that we have node 12 uh, that is going down because you know, you've got a, a trainee who's just unplugged a cable because they needed to recharge their uh, smartphone, for example, and they didn't pay attention to, hey, I didn't know the server was connected to this. Or maybe he was playing Among Us on the phone and he just didn't pay attention and he was just uh, stumbling on the cable and shing, the cable was unplugged. All right, so Note 12 is online, is offline. So if we have a replication factor of three and two nodes, remember, uh, are still online uh, because the train is not everywhere, um, we just asked for quorum for writing. So what is a quorum? On three, on three servers, it's three divided by two, 50 percent. So it's one and a half plus one, two and a half, round it down, two. That's the quorum. So we need two nodes to acknowledge, say, we did what you asked us. And what happens if you've got a quorum of this? Well, the first two nodes are going to answer. It's going to be slightly slower because maybe the not 12 was really fast. But the writing will be considered down and the third one will be you know, coming back to job later on. So, for instance, uh, the, the, the primary nodes just going to keep uh, all the tracks of what failed and it's going to retry for a few hours, by default it's three hours, and uh, there's a table which says, uh, I have these things to do, but it's not local writing, it's not commit logs, it's not uh, in handoffs, it's just a list of events that happened and I tried to contact node 12 and it did not answer. I'm sorry, I will retry. So periodically the node is going to, hey, 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 is the node 12 back? I'm going to try and until the node 12 comes back, okay? If, for example, we had asked um, consistency strategy of one and two nodes are done, like here node 14 and 12, then two could become a coordinate two. And Cassandra is going to write on this last one and say, everything happened right and correctly. What's happening next? We'll see later on. Here's the magic. Okay, and of course, if two nodes were done and you ask for a quorum, Cassandra is going to return that it didn't write anything and it couldn't write anything. Okay, because that's too much. So what happens when you read? Uh, it's pretty much the same thing. Note that Cassandra uses another magic thing. It's called Bloom Filters. Um, I'm going to talk about Bloom Filters. Um, it's just the same about things, you know, mem tables, 
uh, and SS tables, okay? But Bloom filters is one little cool addition to Cassandra. So just imagine you're handling uh, Outlook.com, Gmail.com, like billions of emails, billions of billions of emails, and or just think that you are using URL shorteners or uh, unique link generators or stuff like that. You have billions of possibilities for how many are really, really present in the database. How many are really uh, stored? You don't know, but you got more non-possible matching values than you get actual stored values. So Bloom filters are a concept that was described and implemented for the first time in 1970. These are really super fast algorithms that determine if a value is um, is into an, uh, an ensemble a table uh, in a probabilistic way. So it's going to say uh, it's going to be able to determine if a value is into a table or not. It knows if a table, if a value is absolutely not in the table. It's going to be 100% right if it says the value is not in the table, you don't need to go through the table, the value is not inside. But if the value could be inside, it's going to give you a number, like it's probably this one, and this number is reliable, but it's probability, so you don't know. Maybe it's not going to like, you could say there's 90% chances it's inside and it could not be inside. So. At least you, you could just trust it when it says it's not. So that's pretty good. So also you can have the, the, the table scattered, split on on several files, and you want to apply this algorithm to each of the file and uh, to know if it's worth it or not to go into the file and into which order you want to scan the files, okay? Because some tables, remember, some tables could be really huge, okay? So the advantage is, uh, Bloom filters uh, take really, really little storage place and they are lightning fast. Uh, also, you can change the value, uh, the detection value, the threshold value, which you want to have uh, uh, a chance to look in the table or not. Uh, if you want to use more memory uh, or more chances to say it's not going to be two. So yeah, you can have to change to fine tune this detection factor. So to read, Cassandra is going to interrogate the mem tables. Then it's going to read the row cache, then it's going to read the blow filters, then the key cache, then it's going to check the partition structure, uh, like in RAM, is it a good partition, can I read it, how do I read it, where do I read it, and then it's going to read the data. So the row cache is the cache that Cassandra maintains for the lines that are very often read, could happen, so Cassandra is really good if you read all the same lines very, very often. And the key cache is a cache that Cassandra maintains to just have better um, key index, so it knows where to find data on disk pretty often and pretty faster. Okay, and last but not the least, how do you delete data? Uh, this is, again, very different from relational databases. In a relational databases, you just delete the data, the space is, the space is freeze, and you can just put another value later on, like null, for example. With Cassandra, it's slightly different. Remember, the physical tables are immutable. You cannot, you, you're not going to change the value into and just delete the lines. It's just not working. In the main tables, you can. So instead of deleting data, you're just going to create a writing data who's going to add a marker, which is called a tombstone, uh, that indicating that the, the data has been deleted. And as it is an, a, a writing operation, you, it just can fail. A node can crash, be disconnected and everything. So the data can be on several nodes. So you have to synchronize these suppressions, these deletions, just like modifications. So you, you want to avoid uh, zombie and dying undead data. That's just neither alive, neither dead. Like uh, no dead, it's just like uh, this data. That's just, you don't know if it's fresh data, but you should read or not. Is it dead? I don't know. So the nodes are going to communicate to tell them, to remind them they have to do some operations like suppressions. So if a node was cut from the network, it's going to be little on the on the trade. Now it's going to be delayed, it's going to be late on the data uh, operations. So the others are going to tell him, this little node, tell it what to do and how to update based on small and fast comparisons on this one. La the last time he was alive, what, what did the node do? Okay, so... You could also uh, start manual synchronization commands to uh, do this and start a, a, an automatic correction if you want to. And last but not the least, yes, the data is going to be deleted when we just saw it, when you write into the SS tables. 
So you just have your information gone from memory tables, mem tables, to SS tables. And then remember, assembled, compaction, new ones, all once dinted, the, the old data is just gone. There's nothing else. And that's it. Cassandra just deleted your data. So let's go into detail. Something that's just going to interest us a little more, how we use Cassandra and how we build NoSQL operations. So uh, this is what you are used to. If you don't already know it, this is uh, the formal habits we all have all coming from the 90s, 70s, the normal forms. Uh, we all learned it, I learned it too. The normal forms is this thing you have heard about in uh, SQL courses and relational database courses, and um, also modelization on information systems around these databases. So uh, maybe you just use them without knowing it, without realizing, especially the three or four ones. It's just um, a successive pile of constraints that you have to apply to your systems to uh, avoid possible problems in storage. So uh, each normal forms adopts and embraces the previous ones and adds something. Okay, so uh, starting from this, you generally start building database and databases and the, the um, relational model is a little more intuitive that it, it comes after after a moment because it's more adapted to the, this era when the uh, storage was limited. So the purpose of this is to limit and avoid redundancy and have read times that are pretty fast. Okay, so you see this, uh, for example, this is, hey, that's my name. So you got people in departments here and you put a foreign key here and this is a key that just links to the rest. Hey, Google, please just hand the slides, okay? So this is going to be uh, linked to the other uh, data here. So uh, I'm pretty sure my head is over the last data. Now it's good. Okay, so this is what's going to happen to this data. So this is how you would just implement things uh, with SQL, you know, so you have to have relational databases and what does it do? You get this. You get this physical data model that's just impossible to read. Um, you know, if this is this thing that usually um, print down on A4 papers, whatever, international papers formats. You just got 87 of them, you just stick them with touch, um, with duct tape on the walls just for the people to not see you through the uh, open space windows. And it's true, I had colleagues who just did that with lots of databases and they did this and they printed it on the walls and everyone's doing this because it, it makes you look like cool, like you are giving the impression that you are working. Uh, you're not. but. At least it's fun, okay? So this is pretty systematic in the way to conceive databases in the modern world. So you create tables, you put foreign keys, you index fields, and when you need uh, new things, when you have new needs, but you already have the data, you just d different joints, you know? So you just add more foreign keys, more links between elements, and then you combine everything and you find new ways to link everything. And for example, this is the Drupal eight base um, model system. So this is just a bare out of things solution that does things, but it's empty. In okay? case so it's close to empty when you install Drupal. So in relation in world, you just um, conceive an application where that just basically answer needs, uh, the customer needs and your needs maybe. And uh, more or less it goes to this sense. You've got the needs, then you've got the logical analysis, You gather the needs, what to do, you analyze, this, you analyze what the needs, so how to make a response, how to build an answer to that. You uh, have a deduction, you have a, a, a conclusion of domains, what you call the domains, if you if you domain driven design or whatever, you just design the different parts of the system. And then you got the technical analysis, so you just uh, modelize the data that reflects your analysis, you know how to store this, and then you build models around it, so uh, you just uh, dispatch the uh, application responsibilities, and then you develop an application uh, around this model. So uh, if the model is not good, you just uh, recoup and you just uh, rejoin the data in a different way. So the relational models are based on two aspects, two essential aspects. We just say that, but I'm going to just say that once again. We've got the maximal flexibility. Just look, we could just, just we could just uh, recoup everything. We could just uh, link everything thanks to a SQL language uh, that just formalizes everything. So you don't have to relearn everything every time you have to change uh, technology or whatever. 
And also, this is for a minimal space storage because as we saw, we just already have the data and pretty geniusly, actually it's pretty good, you just uh, have to link the data to say, I just have a data, I want to link this, that, join with this, where this is not existing and this has this value. So this comes from an era when the hard disks uh, are just replacing the uh, magnetic tapes and uh, the uh, floppy disks uh, were just uh, really too expensive and too slow to go further. So when you do to the when you go to the NoSQL world, it's just different. So you still have the same thing, but everything is just more linear and that cool. So you you think more in terms of action. If you've been doing control, I'm wearing a Symfony. Um, PHP framework uh, hoodie right now. If you think of controller actions, you say this action is going to do something. If you think of CQRS, you go in and say, am I doing a command? Am I doing to do uh, a, a request? Am I going to do a query on the system? Is it a command? Is it a query? So if you have one command, one query, you're going to think of it as one unit of thought. And that's how, that's how you're basically going to say, I'm going to look at my app, I'm going to look what I need to do instantly and stop from the database needs, what I'm going to do and read and write. And then I'm going to write down the applications and this is going to create a model, this is going to create the data. So uh, as a consequence with Cassandra, you start with the app and you you, deduct, you, you, you just guess the models and then you save this model into a database. So as a consequence, we've been saying, I've been saying in from the start in uh, underlying things, you know, there's a lot of replication. Uh, there's a lot of replication. It means lots of data will be more or less present with different utilities sometimes, and in the in the end, it's going to be lightning fast because it's going to be lightning fast because everything will be perfectly optimized for the application, but at the cost of excessive storage. So we're going to ask going to ask questions differently. When and how do we access data? what is the data stream in the application. And of course, uh, we're going to completely uh, integrate the database into the, the sequence of reflection you're going to have of modelization, construction, and uh, how we're going to build this application and the relation we have to the database. It's a relation we have to, but it's not a relational database. Okay, This is a relation between us and the database. The database is not a detached support, it's just uh, an integrated organ to the application. You know, the, the requests are, uh, the queries are part of development and they're part of modelization. So it's a symbiosis, it's not a collaboration, okay? Uh, so the database is not, a, is not an accessory anymore, it's just, uh, it's just, uh, it's just what you do in the other way is just uh, less, it just goes less further, you know, it's not like you would do what you would do with ORMs, for example, the object relational mappers, you know, uh, and you can talk about what I would say is a query drive design, you know, with uh, a design where you just, um, set up the queries first okay so to 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 create apps with cassandra you're gonna have to denormalize we're gonna have to leave the normal forms we've seen a few slides ago so it means we're gonna have to leave the uh, relational world reflexes so um as a summary we're gonna authorize ourselves multiple copies of data which means we're gonna have redundance um, of data to the same place and making a reference to it we're gonna have pointers uh, values in in Fini and um, we're going to have uh, lots of things. Uh, so uh, we're going to um, we're going to leave this reflex of creating more tables, more atomic tables, which means storing the uh, the most the, the smallest regroupable value that represents an entity uh, without having to be depending from the others. So. Instead of this, we're going to create uh, variable length columns into the same tables. So basically, we're just not going to do more tables and more joins. We're going to put more things in the same table. So the links between your tables and your models become attributes. And to compensate this problem, Cassandra offers mechanics that are pretty cool. We're just going back after this. So uh, the first thing you have to understand in Cassandra and this is a second mind fact you have to go through. The table are stocked in a sequential order. When you create a table, you create a data order. Yeah. So then you will only be able to query this data 
in the same order precise, which is the, the order it was stored into, or the reverse order it was stored into. When I say order, I say same exact current order in the same order. It means that your primary key and the indication of clustering order you asked on your petition, which is scattered on nodes, remember it's not on the same nodes, is going to be fixed and is the only way you should get your data. Okay, so if you order, like I said on this piece of schema, if you just order the columns A, then B, then C, then D, you can only select A, then A and B, then A and B and C, then A and B and C and D, only in this order. That's a major conception trouble when the first time you try uh, NoSQL and especially Cassandra um, modelization, you know, this is denormalized and the storage engine is not a freedom, it's a constraint. That's why it's pretty harder to do, okay? So, uh, last but not the least, before we go further into the Cassandra mechanics, um, when you should not use Cassandra, like if you have less than 10 gigabytes of data, it's just not good. This is not big data. Uh, big data is just, at minimum, is just 10 gigabytes. And just come back to this conference next year. I will just tell you it's 50 gigabytes of data, probably. Uh, if you don't need to scale, uh, you got one server, it's going to be one server until the end of time. You don't need Cassandra. Uh, of course, you don't need scalability. You don't use a scalable system, right? If you have no need for high availability, uh, this is uh, not cool for you. And if you have a very low number of transactions, actually, it's not really good either. So if you have this, just go for relational stuff. Just go for different problematics, like just use MongoDB, actually. It's going to be cool if you just have a lower number, but large amounts of data. Document storage is going to be perfect for you, okay? And uh, just to finish on the big data things, this is the limitation of this uh, tutorial and this presentation, what Cassandra is not. Uh, Cassandra is just only the engine uh, to store data in, like to mass store data and to serve as a database engine. It is not made to exploit data, to go through, to iterate data, nor is it for PostgreSQL, MySQL, or uh, Oracle DB. It's not made for this. Cassandra does not include machine learning, graph representation, data streaming. It does not include all any of these things. Data streaming has uh, things and graph representation has things too and machine learning is ranked through you know mostly google things and python uh, language most of the time as of today uh, there are solutions or are maybe if you know about r this is going to be good for you too there are solutions for mass uh, data processing uh, most of the time you will end up on the same two things apache spark and hadoop uh, those technologies are not concurrent they're actually working pretty well all together to just parse data to locate the good data on clusters and stuff but this is another story if you know where this code is from so last but not the least before we conclude this part because it's going to be one last part um if you want to have a last brick to build this knowledge um of yours, this, this wall of knowledge, if you want to finish the brick, how do you interact with Cassandra? That's uh, a pretty good question. So first of all, uh, we just told about them uh, um, through the slides already, but Cassandra has configuration files. Uh, I just copied and pasted the documentation here. There's nothing better to explain than what they do. Everything is here. So if you got this, you got everything. So you got the main thing, Cassandra.yml, yes, this is YAML, is the main configuration file for Cassandra. You got everything you need inside to set up how the server works, the mechanics, the core, the inside, etc. You've got um, a way to set up environment variables. Uh, this is interesting because Cassandra reads the environment variables to pretty much guess what it's going to be in terms of rack, topology, data center and stuff. And uh, you've got, we mentioned this uh, about 50 slides ago, the Rack DC properties and the Cassandra topology properties. This is just simple files where you just write uh, which data center, which Rack this cluster is inside and how it could just connect to each other, okay? Then you've got some logging configuration for logging levels. You've got different um, JVM because Cassandra is written in Java. Yeah, I forgot to say so. Cassandra is written in Java. So you have different number of um, JVM configuration, more or less optimized depending on version. And you've got the um, the archiving parameters for the commit log. Okay, so this is what you see usually in um, slash etc slash Cassandra on Unix. Okay. Uh, so then you've got command line tools. 
fine. You can pilot everything from the command line as well, which is pretty good. Uh, Cassandra has um, those command line tools, and uh, you've got the CQLSH. Uh, CQLSH is just, wow, what does it remind you? What if I told you you use MySQL or PostgreSQL and you've got PGSQL or you've got MySH? Uh, uh, MySH, what is it? I already got MySQL. It's uh, MySQL, MySQL SH. Uh, you've got this and this is the same name. It's just SQL SH. Wow, you just got this. So this is a SQL shell interface, uh, but we're going to talk about this after this. Uh, this is the last part. You've got generate tokens. It's a command to uh, basically pre-populate nodes. Uh, in data center with tokens, uh, you've got node tool. This is the main thing. Node tool was this. It just has a hundred options. It just does everything. You can uh, repair nodes. You can uh, do maintenance um, programs on nodes. You can check what they are. You can force your node to do something like we told, uh, dump VSS tables, dump VMM tables, uh, prepare to shut down, prepare to go back. That's just perfect. Then you've got 12 small programs to handle your data. So just like MySQL, you can dump your data. You can ask to save. You can want a backup, right? If you got the data in the partition, you can ask for partition gathering and data extraction. You can ask for this. Cassandra does this. You can dump, load. You can get metadata. You can split the tables. You can upgrade because Cassandra needs upgrades sometimes and the tables are old. So you can update Cassandra. Then you have to update the tables and stuff. You can list the table contents and something if you want to to see what's happening, all the key spaces. You can repair the tables, you can do anything from tables, okay? And then there's a little tool called Cassandra Test, Cassandra Stress, uh, which is benchmark, which is going to try to break down your fucking cluster. It's gonna bombard it and say like, hey, there's a uh, results. Uh, we just could handle a certain number of requests. So yeah. Uh, and just to finish, a few slides and not the least. Uh, how do you manipulate Cassandra through its uh, abstraction interface? Well, like I told you, it's called Cassandra Quavo language. And yep, it's just SQL. That sounds like SQL, sounds like SQL, right? Let's see. So uh, SQL key points, um, like we saw, uh, we, we need to, uh, we need to denormalize, uh, which is we need to um, quit, uh, as we saw later, normal forms to aggregate data ways we need to. So in the example about, uh, I'm going to show you, you're going to, you're going to, uh, to add the table. So if you, if you, um, if you just do this, uh, I'm going to show this with an example. Uh, you have very similar things from SQL. Uh, you got no joints. I think you understand right now it's just that right there's no joints in cassandra and limited aggregations we're going to talk about this, this is a major point too and uh, the normalization i was so we just uh, leaving normal forms and uh as we saw an example above we're going to instead of um if you remember um gathering the people and departments that i joined you're going to ask to Cassandra to put all the data into one single table. That's what I call here uh, denormalization, okay? Uh, the purpose is to combine table and entities uh, normalized, okay, together to have them make only one single column family, a table. So uh, you just eliminate joints. This is not really natural and usual for a person who's like me, used, used to developing in a relational form, but you'll get used to it. So let's go. What is a request? Uh, what is a query? So if you just look at this, uh, this is a, like I said, 10 times it's a colon family. Uh, a table is a colon family, but you see table, take a Sandra calls it a table just for you. Woo! Looks like hard, right? Looks like SQL actually, ah, not that hard, but not that SQL exactly. So first of all, the first thing you see, you see the, the table name, it's just like in SQL, that's my name, WP. Uh, you see the table of a database, but you don't have to put it. This is exactly, so far, this is exactly a line that you could write in SQL. It's exactly a line, table and database or key space actually in Cassandra. So this is the same thing, right? Um, <clears throat> but you see, uh, you can you can put spaces, you can put spaces, returns, carriage returns, it just handles very well. So it's exactly the same thing as you expect from MySQL uh, command line interface. And I even put uh, this sign in the end, you know, as a, as a semicolon in the end. Oh, so what, what does it look like? It really looks like SQL, okay? So there's a difference. 
the size is not precise. Contrary to SQL, because SQL is on a location size, you know, they are prepared location size. You need to know how much memory is going to take. Cassandra is a column storage. Remember what we said a long time ago at the beginning? Cassandra is a column storage. It just wonders about how to store columns and then it's going to do it. There's an exception. Uh, the columns cannot be more than two gigabytes. And please do not do this. You don't want any single hardware HDD reading two gigabytes of RAM just for one cell, okay? You don't have this, never. So we find a primary key and uh, I put a complex primary key just to make you think still, but I just could have put primary key ID and then say it's over okay that would be this the table would be good it would just not be the same table but the data would be the same but here my primary key is also put into a second second pair of parentheses this is because this is the partition key you remember we had nodes we had partitions and this is going to be the partition key this is what we use to generate the token. Long time ago, I put you in my node schema with the token tables, okay? This is what's going to be the source table for the source data for the hash function, murmur free, that's going to be smashing this ID into a 64 digit number, okay? This is what you're going to say. And this is how you are going to uh, order your data into the table because it's always going to be stored like this. So here, if I didn't put anything like this, it's going to be stored by ID, the name and value. All right, this is what Cassandra is about. And oh, let's go the other way. Let's go how we just insert data. Okay, um, so this is pretty much like SQL. Actually, this is almost writable in SQL depending on your database management system the last line should be put within codes quotes or not it it depends okay so uh this is a composite colon okay uh if you look at it you got the, the same thing table name key space name i mean database name if you want to call it okay uh you got semicolon in the end you got fields insert into parenthesis fill 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 value 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 hmm, looks like sql okay so um you just got a function, uh, but just like in MySQL or PostgreSQL, you got exactly the same thing. You can generate things on the fly, okay? Uh, this is a function, like if you do for max, mean, value, average, it's just a function, okay? So the partition key is mandatory. Uh, the SGBD, the, the um, DBMS is not going to, sorry, translating. Remember, I'm translating from French full time. Uh, this um, DBMS is not going to generate it by itself because your ID is not sequential. It's just uh, a random number. We're going to talk about this. So the most important part in Cassandra is the primary key. Uh, and remember, what you take as a partition key, it will be hashed and determine where did I store the cross request. This slide is actually too long, but it's, it's pretty good. Okay, so I just told you about it. Uh, here, for instance, I said UID, which is a function, generates a universal unique ID. Uh, it's more than something that is really likely to be unique. Like if you just generate universal unique ID, it's a function every language does this. I mean, PHP, Java, C, uh, Go, Python, uh, Scala, Kotlin, everything can generate a UID. It's a function that is based on super random numbers, your current date, um, the MAC address of your machine, I think, for the network, like the a few random generated noise, noise function. It's, it's just like you got a chance to generate twice the same unique ID, but it's like a chance every billions of billions of billions of billions of billions of billions. So you're pretty safe. You're pretty safe. So yeah, this means there is no more sequence. There is no more auto increment like you used to MySQL. You got no more in auto increment. This doesn't exist in Cassandra. Uh, this is incremented by your order, your natural order in the database. And if you want to have a, a unique ID, you don't need to have a sequential unique ID like one, two, three, like the last one plus one, last one plus one, etc. It's just UUID. It's just if you have been on Microsoft, is you the GUID is just the same thing. Okay. Um, it's just think like you can use a primary key with UIDs 
or natural keys. For example, if you have social security numbers or the national identity card ID, which is unique for each citizen in the country, uh, emails, if you want to have one account per email, well, you just have to, you just have to use the email as the primary key, right? That's what we do on Facebook and everything else. You know, your account ID is unique to your email, okay? So here I just did the real things. This is the real unique ID. I tested, I tested it, okay? So I just regenerated a random unique ID that becomes this sequence of characters, okay? This is exactly unique ID, 23E4567 up to 4000 here, okay? And then I put it into the murmur 3 hash with 128 bytes, because uh, 64 bytes, sorry, because you can have different length murmur 3, you can have 32, 64, uh, 128 bytes, okay? So this is a 63, 64 number, and this is your partition key. Even if you had no fields into your insert request, query, you would just have nothing else, you would still have this partition key, okay? So, remember, this is not SQL. You cannot select any field at random in any order, in addition to, of course, having, I remember it, no joints, okay? So you can select star from a table, but you will wind up doing a full cluster scan, which is Cassandra will have to go through the whole fucking cluster across several nodes to read all the partitions to say, I've done, I've read you 1,237 lines and you've got three results. And you know what? They were basically at the start, but that's another story, okay? So this will likely time out. Cassandra is going to say, uh, first time, Cassandra is going to say, I will not do this query. I will not do this. You're gonna, you got a way to say, please do this, Cassandra. Is the, okay, it's gonna say it. It's gonna say, I, I'm gonna do this. It's gonna try to full scan. You're gonna wait. You're gonna wait. And after a few seconds, you can change this in Cassandra YML. I think you just got a timeout, and it's not cool because your system is busy at the same time. Okay, so imagine you have a 500 nodes cluster. That's pretty common actually. That's not a, a huge cluster. Uh, you don't want to scan all your nodes for data trying to find something. Okay, so. Like I said, Apache Spark or Hadoop can do this for you. They can just know your data without having to reorganize it, which is pretty cool, actually. But you will need something. You'll need a partition key. And a partition key is what we saw earlier. Cassandra knows where it is. When you give it a partition key, it knows exactly on which node in the 500 nodes it is. It knows exactly in less than one millisecond, well, one, less than one million seconds, actually. Uh, it, it, it microseconds. It, it just knows exactly on which node the data is. So it just queries instantly this node and say, this is here. I need the data is here. You got it. You got it. You, you, I want this token. Then I say, oh, right, I got it. Boom. And you got the data. So uh, this is how it's going to, to work. Okay. Uh, you, you know, primary node example, you got one primary node and two replicas or three replicas in total. And yeah, so uh, you can force some requests, but you have to think about this. So what is the primary key? Well, uh, if you just come back on the previous example, uh, I've just written a pretty strange primary key. So the first one is the identifier you want to request on, you query on, you know, this is uh, like, could be one colon, could be several colons, and, uh, and that's whatever you want it to be. This is a composite primary key, okay? Just like in SQL, you can actually do the same thing in SQL. And the second is the default, the default clustering order for every element, which means, and this is a little weird, the elements that will define the order in which Cassandra maintains your records. Your lines will be always ordered through the clustering orders using this clustering order. So you can put as many columns as you want to sort on. And actually, it's an order ID, then name, then value. You, actually, this is uh, order ascending by default. I can put descending. I could write name DESC, just like in SQL, and they would just, Cassandra would just order by name descending, okay? Just remember, a column family a table always has a defined and working precise order all the time. This order, uh, unless you really give no order to Cassandra, which is possible, but good luck for finding your data, right? Uh, is is going to define if you can make some queries or not on the table after. This is where that the, re the query will be not doable or doable on your table. Um, so now you remember why it was essential and and 
very important, it was primary importance to very well know your storage structure, like the schema I gave you a little slide ago. So you just have to think your application, think the actions, what you're going to do, the command query, whatever you need. You just do it, you store it in the database, and you never try to, to distort what your database is supposed to do. So you will not improvise once it's done. That is the reason why. <laughs> that is exactly the reason why you cannot improvise. Because all the lines with the same partition keys also will be stored on the same node. You can have the same time, the same partition key several times. This is the load, okay? If your ID is five and you think telling Cassandra just generate on um, a number, for example, like my primary colon here ID was uh, an integer, I would say five, 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 five. Cassandra will store five different things, but it will just try to generate different tokens. So it can have the same tokens, but as long as the tokens are the same, the primary keys are the same, it's just going to be stored on the same node to, to load going through nodes uh, and sub-optimizing the uh, network scattering. So what does it mean? It means if you look how it's stored in database, it's going to be like that. So uh, everything is stored next to each other on the, on the disk to just improve reading sequencing on the disk. If you just go on the disk, you're just going to go like this. You're gonna go partition key one, then key two, then key three, then key four. Then your clustering order. So you have a, a, an order, you have one, two, three, four, then one, two, three, four, etc. And then these are the columns you didn't order anything on. So they could be ordered, they could be unordered, they could be exactly the reverse order. They could be anything, you can have millions of columns, you don't give a fuck, it's gonna be, the rest of your data is just uh, asset data, okay? So remember, if you have this in database, you will have a natural order of data. So here, just look. If I'm inserting, inserting into this table, like create table, my table, primary key, partition key, year, month, day. Remember, I didn't precise any parentheses what is Cassandra going to do? If there's no parentheses, it's going to say, well, the first one is just the clustering key. Okay, the Cassandra is just going to ignore. This is the same as adding parentheses around partition key. It's just the same. Like remember in this uh, example here, I could just remove the parentheses. Okay, so if I just do this, um, I got this clustering order by year, month, and day. So Cassandra is going to say, "All right, uh, I'm going to I'm going to do this." So how am I going to insert the data? Just imagine, I'm inserting four times, partition key, year, month, day, and X, whatever. The same values, test, 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 test. 21, 2021, 2021, 2021. 1111, stuff, 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 stuff. I'm just going to change the day, five, six, seven, eight. Remember, I said also by day descending. So when everything is flushed into the SS tables, Cassandra, will have these partition keys, then everything is of the same value, but it will be eight, seven, six, five, not the reverse order. Why? Because I said store by day descending. So every time I say, for example, Cassandra insert um, test 2021-17 is going to make a new thing into a new insertion into the mem tables after writing to the commit logs is going to split the SS table here because it needs to be here or it, 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 it just to, to have an, a way to find if it's above or below it's just there's an order for this if there's no way to differentiate it's going to write below so it's going to say this one or above sorry above. This, this one is fresher so it's going to be written above so it's going to be the new line uh, between the eight and the seven and then it's going to keep going you know because these are clustering colon it's always going to be inserted into the right place okay so Let's go about talk about SQL for a finish line. You know, I'm going to try to finish this presentation within three hours and 15 minutes. It's quite short, actually. Um, so, of course, uh, we're going to do SQL and we're going to be constricted by Cassandra structures and we have to do things. So, first of all, things you want to write databases. So, databases in Cassandra is called key spaces because it has hash tokens and keys, you know. So, yeah. So, it's just. Uh, approximately the same thing as schema, you know. Uh, so you just use the same keywords, actually. You just say create key space. If not exists, what well, you, you you can use this. Your key space name, 
and this is exactly the same as is SQL, but you could just add durable rights. What is durable rights? Uh, just it's true by default. Do not touch it. If you remember the commit log we saw before, it's just to deactivate commit log, which means have no history. You want to just go straight into main tables uh, or nothing. Um, if you are on a single data center and it's pretty simple and it just boom goes out of power you just lose everything what was waiting in ram you just lose everything so this is really bad don't do this you can alter you can drop key spaces just like with sql you can drop databases you can drop key space okay so um this is just pretty good uh for example you cannot uh, alter everything just like tables is quite pretty hard you can alter tables but you cannot change the data storage for everything okay so uh, just uh, one more thing Cassandra is less, my, just like MySQL actually it's just case insensitive so you can put um, upper uppercase or lowercase here like I just put true or false it just doesn't matter okay uh, if you want to use something stored in um, uppercase or if you want the case to matter just use quotes if you use quotes Cassandra will say all right I was just tore it as a uh, um, s uppercase s is not the same as uppercase lowercase s okay so then you have the replication factor um when you create your key space uh that's how cassandra handles the replication factor remember the number of nodes handling your replicas is it how many of them are going to handle a similar sub part to this one if it was the only one and each node becomes a replicate with equal importance so like i told you by default it's going to be three you can change it okay so this is how you define we're going to talk about this this is how you define your replication strategy and this is how many replicates you want to have if you want just to test for the first time just create a replication factor of one and you don't need anything else okay uh, so the difference as i told the strategy there are two strategies mostly you got simple strategy uh, which means you got one data center, one rack, and you don't use anything else. If you have one rack, one data center, use simple strategy. If you have anything else, just use network topology strategy. Uh, I mean, of course, as soon as possible, you should use the second because in the second one, you just create for each data center how many replications should be done. Like you have different replication strategy on each data center. Yes, you can. It's pretty cool, actually. You can have a small data center with two replications as a backup and a main one with five if you want to have five or something, or three and one, whatever you want to be, okay? So um, Cassandra also stores uh, tables as columns. So this is why Cassandra, remember from the very start of the presentation, is called column oriented. The lines contains column and not columns containing lines of value crossed. Okay, so you can have this as a pretty equivalent of a table in a relational database. You can have zero to n key space. Um, it just contains an ordered number of one to n rows, and each row is meant to one to n columns this i don't remember how many you can put i think it's not unlimited but it's pretty large <laughs> um the number of columns is not fixed it's, it doesn't have to be the same all the time this is not a sql table okay you can add new columns you can remove columns without updating or changing data with null values by default if it doesn't exist it doesn't exist it's cool you just added a colon okay so the columns uh, is equivalent to a colon in LBMS. Uh, actually, this is pretty close. You got uh, zero to n in a row. Um, I don't even know if you can't read with zero. It doesn't matter, but okay. Uh, depending on definition and previous rights, you can zero to n, okay? It can be order or unordered, what we see, okay? Uh, depending on the colon family definition, remember the part of the primary key and then indexed or not, okay? The columns can be simple, like a scalar value. Scalar value, remember, is just uh, an int, a float, uh, an integer, uh, a string, whatever you tell me, or a composite value with nested values, like a, 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 an array or something like that. We're going to talk about this, okay? So the simple columns, if I was to talk about the Cassandra syntax, uh, which is very close to the JSON syntax, actually, if you look at this, I just put an address for like where I give my lessons usually, uh, and you've got name, value, and the timestamp I created this thing in this place in and if you want to have a composite column uh, you have the same thing here you got the 
simple scalar value, but then you see you have this complex column with sub-columns, sub-parts, you know, like value CD and zip, and we can just use different stories and different values for all of this, you know. We can add description and this. Remember, this is exactly the same, we just add, added some more overhead and description data, okay? So, uh, then, uh, just coming back on the previous example, you can write anything on the line, on one line, or you can just go to the next line if you want to uh, you know, a brief in your coding and implementation, okay? So this could become pretty harsh on some long tables, okay? So the, the format is pretty simple. Uh, Cassandra uses uh, field number, column definition, uh, and then you use uh, the type, Cassandra type, and you can add a uh, primary key. So you create a table, you put as many column definition and the column list as you want it to be. And your column definition is like I told you ID, UID, which is put a UID on this column ID, etc, etc, etc. Okay. And this one, for example, map int text is a complex column with a nested storage. We're going to fall back on this. Um, just to know uh, this, the, the with close here has tens of options. I will not tell all of them, but we've seen them. You can change clustering order just like this here. You can also uh, specify and change the bloom filter and many other things. Uh, you have to go through the documentation. It's pretty advanced for some of them, okay? But they are cool. So as you know, we can set up the primary key in two ways. Um, you can precise on the column definition which one is going to be a primary key, but just like adding uh, ID, UID, primary key, comma, this will be the primary key definition, but it's going to be one and only one and only column. You cannot have a composite column. There's no, there's no way of writing. There's no syntax for this. And um, then the petition key is mandatory for all selection requests or all deletion requests. That's how Cassandra uses um, data reading to just know where to find thing okay so when you create a primary key you have to tell cassandra what you want a unique uh, selection key and the clustering order you know the uh, the, the the order you're gonna all you're gonna you're gonna sort your, your data to uh and um by default cassandra will take the first one being the primary key and the rest as clustering columns which is if you look at my example here uh, if you write primary key A, it's going to be A. If you write A and B, it says, all right, there's no inline inside parentheses, but several columns. The first one is going to be the partition key, okay? So if you add parentheses, okay, this one's going to be partition key A and then B, okay? This one or one, both of them actually. So ABC is going to be partition key here and clustering key is going to be BC. And if you do this, which is what I did above, I think, uh, not, not, not really, it's just, uh, my example is not here, but it's close to this. You have a composite uh, primary uh, composite um, partition key here and a clustering key C, and then you can have both of them, just this is uh, the composite partition key and you have composite clustering keys and clustering columns here, C and D, okay? So remember, the partition key is the data distribution across your nodes. The clustering key is the data sorting within the partition. The primary key is the single field key table. It's the same key as the partition key. And the uh, composite and compound key is any multiple column key like we did just here, okay? A and B, okay? And then, what should you store your data into? Uh, it's just pretty straightforward. You got uh, int, big int, and tiny int, which is 32 bytes, 32 bits, 64 bits, and 8 bits. Okay. Then you've got uh, the var int, which is a variable uh, storage of a variable int length. Okay. And then all the other ones to uh, var int, number, float, and decimal are just what you find in Java. Okay. So if you just wonder how they work, just go to the Java documentation. Cassandra is written in Java, so this is written in Java. So uh, float is 32 bits and double is 64 bits, okay? You can change with decimal the separator with uh, um, the, um, the the first and the decimal part, the, the, the entire decimal part, the integer and decimal part, but yeah, that's basically what it's about, okay? Uh, you can have ASCII value, which is uh, only 127 characters like the one you have in the ASCII table. Uh, then you have text slash varchar, which is exactly the same thing, but they're just pure synonyms. Varchar and text are just exactly the same. They added this just to 
maybe uh, flirt a little with my sequel developers. I don't know. So this is uh, 128 different characters, and it doesn't have any length. Okay, this doesn't have any length. It's just uh, whatever you want it to be. As long as it was, uh, it's going to be Cassandra is going to store it. <clears throat> okay, and this is um, a way to store IP addresses v4 v6. Okay. Uh, this is data types for, um, you know, the classic time storage. So not for date and time. Uh, there are timestamps usually by default, <coughs> which is the number of um, seconds that have passed since the first uh, January the first, nineteen seventeen, at midnight. Uh, if you don't, if you're not used to timestamps, they could be just um, a little disturbing for you, okay? Uh, and if you just go to the documentation, you'll see that date, time, timestamps, and duration accept a huge number of different syntax, like I told you, date plus time, or um, ISO, ISO official formats like uh, this one, for example, you would just recognize from MySQL. It just, it just could be an integer with a timestamp. Everything is just pretty going to work with Cassandra. It's just going to check pretty well, but you've got like, I don't know, I, I say between 10 and 15 different ways of writing dates and timestamps, okay? So it's pretty cool. So we've got the boolean, true false, which is just what you expect it to be, okay? Uh, the blobs are just like in SQL, except remember, not more than two gigabytes. That's pretty large, don't do this. Uh, just don't even try 500 megabytes. It's just already too much for a colon. You don't need that. Um, the counters are special. This is just, uh, you cannot update them. You can just define them. You can, uh, you can, you cannot define them. You can just only update them. They're just like, uh, plus, plus, minus, minus. And once you have counters on the table, it just has primary key and counters. The rest is just not possible to mix with normal data. But it's pretty fast. It's really fast. Uh, the UID, we just talked about it. Uh, really universal ID, maximum ID universal. Okay. And, uh, time UID is just the same thing with a little more randomness things. Okay. Um, it's just made on, you know, date time on the machine you're working on and stuff like that, okay? Uh, Cassandra proposes several ways of creating non-scalar values. Um, first of all, uh, there are the three famous uh, ways, like you have in JSON, actually. The lists, the sets, and the maps. If you look at what you write in JSON or JavaScript, it's going to be the same, actually, okay? This is just like the way you store objects in JavaScript. So, the lists are simple ordered, uh, this, this has an order, ordered value, okay? So it can, it can store uh, duplicates, like you could have value one, value one, value one, and the indexes will be zero, one, two, okay? And it only stores values. The sets here uh, doesn't don't have any order, and then don't allow uh, duplicates. Like if I say value one, value one, value one, there's gonna be a set of value one once, okay? This is just only, uh, non duplicates but not older okay and the maps is the more evolved version with everything uh precise like key and value key and value key and value all right and everything here is just uh within your hands so here um i just made something really weird i just mixed on the values just to show you it would be able it would be possible to use whatever you want it to be okay and the tuples is just uh an ordered uh, ordered list but they have a fixed structure, which means the size is um, precise all the time. If we say, for example, a geolocation is made of latitude, longitude, and a zoom level on a map, for example, on Google Maps, and note that the order is important, I can only create a new tuple into a field and insert into some float value, some float value, and some int. I cannot re reverse or mix or forget anything. It has to be the same, otherwise meem, Cassandra will beep and say you cannot do this. All right. Also, you can create personal and custom types, like here. I just use uh, a custom type phone, and uh, this is okay. This is something I just took from the official documentation, actually. So yeah, uh, you, you just have these types. So you create a type phone, then your type, your colon phones is using a map of text, like whatever you want to be, home, um, professional number, whatever you mean, and phone. So phone is referring this. And then user has addresses, a field of map of text here and frozen address. All right, this is new thing. I wanted to introduce things here. Uh, frozen is pretty straightforward, but I'm gonna name it and explain it. Um, frozen uh, just means that the stored value here is not something you can modify because yes, in Cassandra, you could ask to just modify 
the phone here, you know? And uh, frozen means you have to update or delete everything. Like if you want to update the value here, you have to give the whole complete new value and just not update this tiny, tiny value inside of it, okay? That's just a way to make sure you don't want to, you want some, I don't know, consistency, internal consistency to your things. Um, so yeah, uh, there's something you do. What can you do? I told you about this. If you still want to select a non-indexed and non-clustering columns, well, you can actually Cassandra allows you to do this. If you want to make a select and where on an index column, like, I don't know, the age of a person in a sorted table by ascending name and first name, but you didn't have uh, an age sorted. Okay. So if imagine you have the French population, like the French worldwide population right now. We are, I'm French, uh, as you can hear, we got 67 million people, okay? 67 million lines in a um, snapshot because it's going to change tomorrow. People will have birth and died, okay? So uh, approximately 1% of these people are 20 years old. See, if I want to just uh, select the 20 years old people, it's not gonna be very efficient, but let's have a table of my students, they are uh, working in a structure called IoT, there are either 18, either 19, even 20. That's 30% of people who are 20, actually, in the in, the, in this environment. This is really efficient. It means one of the th of third um, results are going to be um, accurate results, okay? So Cassandra doesn't know if your table request is going to be clever or not and by default is going to return um, a warning and a refuse, a denial that says, I will not do your request because I got no idea where it could go and it's probably going to be a timeout. But if you want to filter on a colon, for example, you can have the colon as a partition key. Okay, that's gonna be working. Uh, it can be indexed and in the clustering key, for example, it could be just simply indexed. It could be filtered also using the query with allow filtering. If you do this, you allow Cassandra to filter the results out of the whole data set. So if you want to compensate this, best thing is to review your models and change the data structure of the tables. Maybe, maybe it's just going to be a new thing in your system. Maybe you have a change and uh, it's going, your change is going to be done at some point. So why not change the models, okay? If you don't, maybe you want to add an index on a table, but warning, the, end, the index are going to add a lot of overhead, overhead and make your table really slower. So uh, it's even, Actually, it's close to be easier to create a new table and duplicate the data. So uh, you could also create a new table to have a new request. Okay, so that's exactly what I said. If you don't want to do an index, you can create a new table. You can also use materialized views. It's on the next slide. So it's basically how to reuse the same data without having to create a new table. And if really, really, really you just uh, wasted all the possibilities, then just create your select and add a low filtering. If you do this, Cassandra will really go through all the lines of the databases and try to match only what is in your request. And uh, you can also filter on less than the columns, otherwise you will have to create an index too. Okay, so a little trick that I just talked about in the previous slide, remember, hey, we saw us from the past, the materialized view. Um, this looks like a complex thing. It's really it's simple and pretty cool, actually. Um, remember, you, we say that we create a lot of redundancy with multiple times, uh, multiple occurrences of the same copy in the same number, in different tables. Like I have a user, I want to have the video of the users. I want to have the post and the comments of the users of YouTube, for example. I want to have, um, I want to have the likes and the thumbs up and the subscription of a user. What if I just don't want to add the user information like email or login or nickname, just like the user ID or username uh, on every table. That's just crazy, okay? So if you had this stored in one table, my example is a little extreme, okay? Uh, you can have multiple tables that will have the same columns, but if you update one of them, 
the other ones will never be updated. So what can you do to compensate with this? Cassandra creates materialized view if you want it to be. Um, it's, it's just, uh, you can have manual process, right? But just synchronize the data through your table, which is pretty hard actually, because it's a lot of writes and reads, okay? But Cassandra provides some mechanics to do this. So materialized view are tables that you don't handle. Cassandra handles the tables, they just do it for you. So Cassandra will maintain synchronized um, data between tables and materialized views. So at a glance, uh, you just create like a view, for example. You create a structure that is going to be a different selection of the same data on the table. Like if I had in my previous example uh, the table uh, of people stored by UID as a primary key, then other than name, you just create a new materialized view to sort by age, for example. If you want to have people for a certain age, if you want to say where age equals 20, you'll have to do this. Okay? So uh, here I just gave you an example. I just created a, a table with a primary key, ID name, and then I create another table uh, in a materialized view, which is, remember, it's still a table, but it's still handled by Cassandra. And um, if you look at this, uh, you say the primary key is ID name with clustering order by name, and this time, I can do the same thing in a different way. Like I can just can select the name in a descending order. And it's going to say what is going to be the cache, uh, all the keys and the rows per partitions. It's just going to be the same, okay? And uh, you can add a comment too. This is just not my it's just to remember it if you want to describe a table, just like in MySQL. And this is going to allow a new query to be done. Uh, so remember a few things. Um, there are limits on your um, materialized view. The primary key of the initial table has to be in the materialized view. Uh, you can only add one colon in addition to the primary key. The view has one purpose, okay? Uh, you can add, th this is going to add a little um, overhead, like yeah, it's gonna be 10 percent slower when you write things into your main table and read things approximately two um, and of course this uh, materialized view and table has to be in the same key space okay but we just had this all together okay so here if i was just to insert a new user in my table demo table here the wp the materialized view would be instantly before any write is done we just know when the write is over here it just has the new value so if i just select on the materialized view it instantly has the value we don't need to do two writes on two nodes and two write instructions so this is pretty cool actually um also like i just gave you two slides above you can add custom indexes um you can add extra indexes cassandra will only index primary keys by default so you can add as many indexes as you want but it has a cost. Like I told you, it just slows down, Cassandra. So you should just use them with a little care. They're just like here to help column selection uh, without having to recreate table, essentially. So for practical reasons, okay? So remember, uh, adding indexes to just query anything is really bad. Just create new tables. Uh, also, index doesn't work on counters and uh, it doesn't really work on columns that are <clears throat> never or almost never updated or on columns where the values are most of the time different. It's just like a classic index in MySQL. If you have recurring values like very, very common and reused values into a column, the index is going to be really perfect. If you have all different values, it's not going to be cool. And to finish a few... A few slides then. You can also do range results. You can uh, have this tool um, results. So uh, you can limit the number of um, results you want to have. Like if you just want to have the last five posts of user of social networks, you don't need to query the 1000 of them. Okay. Uh, you can also um, limit the number of results by your range comparison, but you still have to uh, use a low filtering. And this is cool, I love filtering, it's cool, like I told you, on small tables, for example, on tables that are reasonably large, that you don't have to go through. So you just do this and this works, okay? You can allow filtering. Then you have the um, stable, assistable attached secondary index, the SAISI index. Uh, so 
using its Java, you can add a custom index on a table and you can add using this very specific index definition with contains. And then you can, uh, if you use contains, you can do all these three queries. If you don't use contains like starts with, you just only do the first person, okay? So under certain circumstances, you can do this uh, with a special index and query with this, okay? This is pretty useful actually. So um, there are other extensions in Cassandra to allow like manipulating um, strings, timestamps and stuff like this, okay? You can also manipulate the results, uh, but also manipulate the data structure with precision. Like I'll give you an example here. You can select from your table where time equals minus two days. This works. Cassandra understands how to manipulate the time like that. This is pretty cool, actually. And like I told you uh, above, the sets, lists, and map can be manipulated directly. So if you just uh, update like my table, whatever it to be, you can you can do things like this: my set equals my set plus this. So this adds a new entry to a set. Um, this uh, empties the sets. Uh, this uh, adds a new element to the list. This. Uh, reduces and re removes an element from the list. And this is how you do, I just didn't write everything because there are many of them, but I didn't have a slight space, but you can just add a uh, value to a map and you can delete it the same way. Okay, so this is how you handle um, directly. And of course you can do this into more deep, um, into deeper uh, maps and other um, multiple sets, okay, uh, collections. You can also ask Cassandra to count. That's perfectly fine. You can just ask it to select count from whatever you need, as whatever you need. Um, you can also have the basic um, statistics function, like the sum, the average, the minimum, and the maximum. It's just working the same way as SQL, you know? You can also use batch to apply several queries sequentially. Uh, this allows atomicity and isolation on one partition, uh, or close to it, I would say, um, or just atomicity on several partitions. Uh, actually, uh, this is a heavy workload for the coordinator node. It's going to ask a few more things to the coordinator node and it really slows down insertion. But if you want to have, uh, like using timestamps, what time is it? And if you are doing several insertions, all the insertions will have different timestamps. If you do this, all the insertions will be done with the same timestamps, which is pretty cool actually, okay? And last but not the least, you can also have user-defined function. This is a whole field because you can write Java here. You don't need to write too much Java because you're gonna probably going to crash your database. But as long as this works, you can do something. Okay, so this is a function that returns the log of uh, a value that is provided as, um, as a double value. Okay, so you, you can create a custom function and then use uh, select f log from etc. Okay. So that is how you basically had SQL at a glance. And last but not the least, because this slide is almost over, um, how do you use Cassandra with your programming language? Well, uh, right now the company behind Cassandra, mostly maintaining it is called Datastax, and Datastax is uh, pretty active on the drivers. They've been maintaining all this language. Uh, I just put them in order of maintainability because the rest is pretty, you know, the, the first ones are okay, but then Ruby, PHP, Perl, Rust, and I just slowly being abandoned because there's not that many people who use it, so okay. Um, and yeah, um, they are not all of them very supported, but the majority of them, the most of them here are very, very well supported. I tested them all and they're really working, so that's pretty cool. And uh, one last word before we conclude this uh, long presentation of Theo was in a health. Um, I was talking about Cassandra 3 uh, as this video is being made, and Cassandra 4 has been under the hood for like months, if not years right now. Uh, it's coming, uh, it's coming, it's still beta, it's not labeled as fully stable. It's labeled as the most stable release of Cassandra ever, that's what they said. Um, it has 1000 plus fixes, bugs, etc. Uh, it's going to be adding a synchronous node communication, it's going to improve streaming, like they said first it was 10, then 20, then 50, then 100. Right now they say it's actually 500% faster streaming of data, which is pretty insane. 
Uh, I think Apple's gonna like it, Nike. And um, it's got no coordination or restart, which is pretty cool when you just add a restart or not. You say, just go restart. You just say, okay, I remember I'm gonna restart. And when restart, it's going to coordinate to know if the data is fresh or not. It's going to have faster repairs. It's going to be real-time logging and monitoring, allowing through the console to have like tools, uh, plug it on it. A uh, new version of Java is coming, Java 11 for its uh, base version of Java and uh, the new Z garbage collector is going to be adding lots of performance and uh, memory use optimization. Uh, virtual tables uh, is cool, so Xandra internal data is going to be exposed through SQL, like just like MySQL does for example actually. Um, it's got security improvements, like, I just didn't precise, but Cassandra by default is just plain, log plain login, you don't even need passwords, but you can set up a login password table, you can secure SSH, SSL uh, communication, many things like this. You got a lot of security if you want to add security connection, but if you just want to try it out, it's pretty good. And with that, I think you got enough of what you need to be damaging your infrastructure and uh, go shoot everything. So uh, that was Cassandra and I hope you like this because that was very long. I'm sorry, it's really long for a course, but I think you got the idea of why we built Cassandra, why we built big data, why the world has changed and uh, how Cassandra was born, the ideas between it, between it and um, how it emerged and who is using it and how it works and how you maintain it. Uh, I didn't put enough emphasis on the administration part because it's quite hard if you got a simple infrastructure, you're gonna need like a thousand nodes, uh, maybe not a hundred nodes I'd say to start uh, facing trouble, facing servers that break down, etc. That's basically what the database administrator is here for. So that will be maybe another story and thank you if you are still here after all this long course. I'll plan to do many more. Um, and uh, shouts out to other people and all the things that helped me made this presentation. I have lots of references. I didn't put them here. I might put them in the description of the video. And of course, thanks to uh, all the things that Detestax is doing because uh, I mostly inspired from their presentations and stuff I found on the internet to build all this presentation. And uh, that's it. Good luck, have fun with uh, Cassandra. I hope you will enjoy yourselves. And uh, yeah, good luck, guys. Uh, thank you very much for staying here. Uh, it's pretty late now. It's 1, in, 1 a.m. actually. So uh, I'm going to finish this. Um, I'm going to finish and let you uh, meditate on this. I hope you had your way through. And I hope you liked what you saw. And if you don't know NoSQL, which is probably the majority of us, I hope it helps. So signing off, see you, and um, good luck with Cassandra and good luck with everything else. Bye.